two, take two. Hey everybody and welcome to Hidden Pearls Podcast. Thank you for joining us this week. We just completed our polar plunge and are now just hanging out in the sunlight. About 50 degrees. It was nice and chilly, but you know, a nice family experience. A little dopamine dump for breakfast. Oh, that's exactly what we want. Just wanted to say happy Veterans Day. Uh, thank you to all those who've served, everybody serving, and thank you to all of our guests that have been on the show this year, last year, ones that go to the games and have fun. Um, you guys are the best. We thank you so much for everything that you do for us in this country. Um, please enjoy this week's episode. It's gonna be a great interview. My dad and my sister do a fantastic job and I'm decently interested in myself. <laughs> have a great this week. week. We have Jason Jarman on and just wanna say it's such a powerful interview. So if you haven't uh, met Jason or heard his story, please stick around. It's a really cool story of just the loops of life and how intricate it can be. So, and the perseverance of the human spirit. So Jason, thank you so much for being on. We can't wait to see all the veterans at the game this week and go Niners. Go Niners, Sunday Night Football. Three, two, one, action. Yeah, she didn't do it. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we are live and rolling. Uh, so, Jason, this is Niners are uh, coming out of their bye week, and they are heading into, uh, this is game nine for them. They're sitting at four and four. We got the Chargers this weekend. And um, we, you and I have been kind of talking about having you on this show, and it just kind of worked out with this one, especially since you are a lifelong Niner fan. So we're going to get to that yeah. whole story. But just want to say thank you very much for, um, for one, for all the things that you do for MVP and your fellow colleagues and veterans, uh, and then taking time out uh, to host us today and to, to be with us and tell your story. So appreciate that very much. So uh, just a quick bio, and then we're just going to get into it. So uh, Jason, again, is up in Seattle. He's an eight-year vet kind of interesting two four-year tours separated by seven years, I think, in there. Uh, and, he's currently, and just recently uh, accepted the position as the MVP program coordinator up in Seattle. So his MVP story, too, is, I think, very inspiring. And um, I think if you're not sure about who MVP is or what it is, um, I think listening to this story is another just kind of resounding affirmation of kind of the process, the program, and the people. So hopefully we'll get all of that kind of stuff. So anyway, uh, and we are very proud, very, very, very proud to welcome back into the studio the, okay. the deeply missed, most beautiful, most wonderful, intelligent, gifted um, daughter and technician and podcastee. So anyway, so she's been gone a little bit. You guys have heard the story. She was in Japan and uh, we've been trying to get her back on the show. She wanted to renegotiate her contract. And that kind of worked me over a little bit, but we finally were able to reach an agreement. So uh, she is back on, and we are honestly thrilled to have you. And I love you very much. And I'm very <laughs> I love you too. Thanks, Bob. All right, so Jason, it's fun. great to see you again. So excited to have you on Good the podcast. You. Welcome officially. You've been through our mindfulness stuff, and we'll get into that. But yes. very honored yes. to have you uh, on the Hidden Pearls podcast. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Bam. Okay. Let's roll. All right. Jay, before we get into the military stuff, just give us a little snapshot of your, where'd you grow up uh, and that kind of stuff. And you're just your family setting. So we have an idea of, you know, how all that worked for you. Sure. Um, so my dad was uh, military air force uh, traveled, of course, around. Um, I am the youngest of four boys. Um, we moved uh, to Seattle uh, when I was in, uh, when my mom was eight months pregnant. Um, so my brothers always say, we know how long we're living lived in Seattle by how old Jason was. So um, moved up here. I was born in 68. Um, and uh, like I said, we'll talk about the Niners later, but I, uh, I love being up here in the Northwest. Um, uh, my family is from, my dad's side's from Arkansas. My mom's from upstate New York and Syracuse. She was an Orangeman. Um, so uh, like I said, the military was in us. Um, I graduated right here in Renton, which is a, it's a town just south of Seattle. Graduated high school here at Lindbergh High School. Uh, played football. Football is uh, was religion in our house. Uh, there was nothing else. Come February, March, we go into the depression for about a month of lack of football. You know, I think I mean? we, so, I think we worshipped the same, the same yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, we did. We do, we do. Um, my brother, uh, actually, my second oldest brother, uh, John, or right above me, he uh, went to Ohio University where he coached and played. Um, and we were the only two that graduated high school. My dad left when I was seven. Uh, mom had to raise the four of us by herself, which has uh, created kind of a chaotic grow up. Uh, but God love her, man. She uh, she raised four boys and fed us and put a roof over our head during the 70s and 80s, you know. Um, and it wasn't hard. That's probably why uh, 
she left us a little early. You know, I mean, we provided a lot of stress, unfortunately, but uh, um, that's such as life. But uh, yeah, lost both my parents. Um, and uh, actually, you know, then I, uh, through the years, uh, the, I had a short spin of time where I lost my oldest two brothers and my wife. So went through a rough patch, that's for sure. And uh, we can get into that later. But that's the grow up. What was, uh, what was your mom's name? Uh, Donna, Donna May Dodge. Dodge is her last name. So uh, German, Irish, uh, Dodge and Haas. My dad was adopted, so we really don't know anything about him on the, on the bloodline. So actually my last name, Jarman, doesn't match the blood, if you know what I mean, because it's an adopted name. So, and we've, we've researched, we look, but we just know he was born in Kansas and him and his sister were adopted by my grandparents down in Arkansas. Yeah. Huh. Well, okay. Well, that's, uh, yeah, a lot there. We could dive into a bunch of that. Yeah. So, well, okay. Yeah, we can. <laughs> well, then, um, well, I guess one of the things I always kind of wonder about is growing up and everybody's, you know, family and familiar experience is always a little bit different. Yeah. Um, so, but what were maybe some of the characteristics or traits or values? I mean, what lessons did you, you know, as you're heading out and hitting 18 and looking at life, you know, what, what do you look back on now and think, well, what were some of the strongest lessons that you learned within your family? Um, I would see the strongest lesson I learned is survival. Um, cause that's pretty much what my mom was a survivalist. Um, there was no really planning for tomorrow. Uh, it was surviving today and then waking up and doing it again. Um, that's what I grew up in. Um, loyalty. I found out that my family is the only one that really, you know, family is family. Uh, the blood's thicker than water thing does fit with my family for sure. Um, we messed with each other and we beat each other up, but don't let anybody come in from the outside and do it. Cause then you had four brothers that were coming at you, you know? Um, so those are probably the biggest two lessons I learned growing up was the survival and the loyalty. Well, pretty powerful lessons. And so just, yep. you know, the tenacity and the resilience, you know, to get up each day and kind of face it. That's, you know, my mom grew up, um, really with no money, you know, kind of on the poverty edge out of Michigan. And she always kept a poster up in our house and it had, you know, this windy road and this dude running, you know, like, and you could see how long it's going to go. And it just said it was one of these, I can't remember the exact quote, but it was the race doesn't go to the swift or the fastest necessarily. It's just to those who keep on running. And it was just kind of a reminder, like, you know, um, cause she, you know, she never felt like she did a whole bunch of things super great, but she did a whole bunch of things, you know, well enough. And then she yep. just never, ever gave up. And so that survival kind of thing. And, and it, what a comforting thing too, to have that loyalty within the family and know that you've got your kind of tribe. So those are pretty powerful traits to take with you. So, all right, Lou, I don't want to cut you off. Anything you want to go on? Are you good? No, I mean, and just thinking, so obviously you have a very strong masculine influence in the family with the brothers, but yeah. within all of them, your mom, uh, is there one person that maybe, I guess if there's like one inspiring lesson or one inspiring person that you really like held on to a moment or a memory, um, is there one that you reflect on? Um, uh, so raising, you know, by my mom, um, I'm the youngest. And like I said, they're five, seven and nine years older than me. So I was the baby. Uh, when I was 25, she they introduced me this is my baby. You know what I mean? And I, as much as I hated hearing it, that's the fact. I was her baby, and I always would be. Um, so my, I think my um, my gentle side obviously came from her. I'm a pretty emotional guy. Um, I can, uh, I you know, uh, things can get to me pretty quick, especially uh, the underdog aspect of it. I am all about that. Um, yeah, and, and I don't like uh, charity. Uh, my mom had to accept it a lot. I think that affected me as a kid, and and I could see that it that it bugged her too. That she had to, but she had to do what she had to do. You know what I mean? To 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 feed us, put a roof over our head. We had neighbors. A good friend of mine would pay our power bill one time because we didn't have power. You know, um, and that's as a kid, it's kind of humiliating. But uh, looking back on it, you know, it wasn't it wasn't too good for her either. But you know, she did what she had to do uh, to survive. And so I think that my mom was a big influence on me with the. Uh, no matter how bad it, bad it got, don't give up. Don't give up. Sounds like you learned a lot of compassion also from her. And I mean, Huge. just in thinking about the role that you're in now and like the office and the yeah. seat that you're sitting in, uh, yeah. having compassion yeah. for, don't I mean, because started already. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, and even just thinking about, you know, all the veterans that I'm sure you come in contact with are the people who really do need that help. I'm sure yep. they really appreciate all the compassion that she did teach you. Yep. Absolutely. And just, hey, tell me, how old were you and your, your father? I was seven when he left. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. still pretty young. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and he moved to Denver. So, I mean, I, even, at, even though I was mad, um, you know, he, 
five, 10 years later has reached out, you know, you want to come over for Christmas, you want to come over for the summer. And, you know, of course, I mean, it's still my dad. I mean, uh, coach, when I told you that thing about your letters to, to, uh, to George, you know, before the game, they'll be, I mean, those, those touched me, you know what I mean? Cause I mean, I, I listen, you ask my family, they'll tell me, uh, family and friends, there's not much more. There's only a few things more important than the 49ers in Jason's life. And me saying that, if you ask them, they'd be like, no, there's nothing more important than the 49ers. <laughs> okay. It's pretty bad. And, uh, and your story, I mean, it really touched me because I, I long for that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? And which probably led to, you know, my, uh, my sexual trauma as a child too, because I trusted and I wanted that father figure, you know what I mean? Which, you know, my mom never knew about this happening even to the day she died. My brothers knew about it, but I would never tell her. I would have killed her, you know? Right. Well, okay. Uh, I have a couple things going on with that. I w- one I was going to yep. say is, um, you were on the zoom last week when we were on the, the huddle, the national huddle now. Yep. Um, and the, one of the father things kind of popped up. One of the guys mentioned, made a father reference and then we had three, I think three or four speakers in a row talk about never hearing from their father that they loved them, that they were proud of them, that they even really kind of knew what they were up to in life. And the the wound that that left, and these, I mean, these are all folks that are, you know, 40-ish and older, I think, or most of them, maybe one was younger than that. Uh, I mean, I'm kind of sitting there listening to that, and it was a really profound, just, you know, reminder about the power of that relationship. And I, and it can go with the mothers too, you know, but I, I just, in this case, we were talking about fathers and sons yep. and, and that part I thought was really powerful. So that was a very kind of difficult thing. And I appreciated those folks sharing that just kind of as a reminder, you know, about getting through childhood and, you know, everybody yep. picks up a nick or two here and there. So then second, so you raised an issue just a moment ago, and I, I don't know how much you want to share with that. So, I mean, no problem. okay. So, yep. I mean, I, um, I just feel like, you know, so, our focus here is about creating opportunities for healing. And, yep. you know, one of the things that happened to us, and so even those father wounds that we have, if it, you know, whether it involves other kind of big T trauma or not, those yep. are all wounds that we carry with us into adulthood. And then one of the things, and I think we've heard Susie talk about this with MVP. I was is just going to bring her up. <laughs> well, you know, because the childhood trauma that we carry into it, and then for those who enter the military, and then when you come out, you know, the military is not a place where you're going to do a lot of healing around prior traumatic experiences. And I don't mean that as a critique. It's just not, that's not what they're about. And and so then folks get out and they still have the trauma from childhood that has not been addressed. And then you roll in with it, trauma and or those military combat, that whole experience. And when folks come out, they're typically not very well equipped to kind of cope with that. So I guess I just want to invite to the extent you're comfortable to share with us a little bit about that childhood trauma so we could put that in context with the rest of your story. So with what you just touched on, I I guess until recently when Susie came into my life with MVP just a year ago, I didn't, I mean, I I went through PTSD training, you know, um, treatment, all that, we'll touch that later, but I didn't realize, you know, when, when, when I came out of combat, I attributed all of my trauma issues with combat and I didn't really realize just how much my childhood trauma, even though, because for me in my mind, I was like, oh, I'm, it's, it's okay. Cause I never thought about it. So, you know, it never bugged me. I never brought it back up in my mind. You know what I mean? Well, what I didn't know is it was just eating and building, you know what I mean? And it really right. shaped me. I mean, my trust factors, I, I attributed to, you know, trust in what happened with me in Iraq, you know, um, or, you know, anything else like that, that all stemmed from that. And that's, that was learning and, and talking with Susie. I didn't realize just how much, you know, it affects us growing up because those are our vulnerable years. And so um, my mom, there was a, a neighborhood guy. Uh, we Everybody has that neighborhood yard that all the kids hang out at, you know, back in the day, you know, uh, before computers when we wanted to be outside. <laughs> so, um, and uh, it was that neighborhood. It was, a, his son was a good friend of mine. Um, always played football in his yard because it was big enough and he'd have sleepovers and stuff like that. Well, that's when, you know, Bob uh, started, you know, doing things. And I found out later on in life that I wasn't the only one. Um, he ended up getting caught. Um, and I find poetic justice in the fact that he got t- testicular cancer, which was kind of just a side note for a little win right there. But um, he used to do things. Um, I never told anybody because uh, just like as I as I got older, I realized they were grooming. You know, what I mean, it's part of their natures. You know, they'll do things for me. They, you know, they they find the ones that don't have dads, the ones that don't have that, because they know that that's what they're going to cling to and they're going to grab hold of. So, someone that gave me attention, somebody that built me up and told me I was a good kid and all that kind of stuff. Well, I wanted to hear that from a male figure. 
And then, and then all of a sudden it meant if I had to do what he asked me to do, well, that was worth it. You know what I mean? Because I wanted to, I wanted to be number one. I wanted to be somebody's, you know, the, the big man on campus is the youngest brother, of course. And uh, if it meant I had to endure that, then I had to endure it. That's pretty much looking back what I realized I was doing. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing that. And, you know, it just kind of adds in another layer there. And I, you know, one of the things that we talk about all the time with MVP is it's okay not to be okay. And yeah. part of that, and part of that means, you know, just acknowledging and accepting kind of the things that have happened and making it okay yeah. to bring it up. Absolutely. You know, and the coach, I, I used to be embarrassed. I mean, I, I didn't tell anybody, you know, especially as a boy, you're embarrassed. Right. I can't let that happen. Well, it wasn't my fault. I was, I was a freaking kid, man. You know what I mean? So I got that finally through my head that, you know, this didn't shape me as the, as the man I am. It just shaped, you know, some of my characters and, and my trust issue, things like that, that now I'm working on and I'm such a different person. And I'm okay talking about it. I'm not embarrassed that it happened to me because I didn't do it to me. Somebody else did it to me, which somebody that was supposed to, you know, I trusted my, my innocence to, you know what I mean? And then this douchebag does what he does. And that's, that's the shitty part about it. Yep. Um, well, listening to you talk about that, I guess I've, I've heard similar stories in the past and just hearing how eloquently you just put that into words and, you know, clearly you've well, thank you. done such a great, a beautiful job of really integrating it and processing it. And I guess I more just want to commend you and applaud you and also give you a hug. Um, but <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. I just, you know, I think when you can put it so matter of factly and be clear as like I'm able to disassociate and like that's that happened to me, but it's not me. Um, that's such a powerful mindfulness practice that we try to integrate all the time. So for you to be able to do it with such a impactful and big T situation, um, it's really amazing. Thank you for that. Yeah. That means a lot. I mean, that's a great tie-in because you know, we talk all the time that we're not our thoughts, we're not our emotions, you know, our mind and our feelings just emerge and they're not right or wrong in and of themselves. They just are. It's what we do with them and how we react to it. But I don't think we spend enough time. It really is the same analysis when we start talking about things that childhood trauma, that things that happen to people or adult trauma that, you know, wasn't your fault and um, separating that as well and not letting that cling to you in a way that creates guilt and shame and drags you down even further. So anyway, well, okay. So I thank you, Jason, for sharing that. And we'll kind of, kind of dovetails all into that. So, all right. uh, Anything else about growing up that you want to kind of touch on as we're going, let's just Uh, jump no, I mean, growing up, I uh, grew up in, I mean, one part is in it, and we'll touch on it later because I saw in there about my cat. I mean, I'm an animal lover. Um, I always joke and say, and I kind of joke, but I'm serious that I want to be the guy, I want to put my military training to use and be the guy in charge of who, of all the people that misuse it, mistreat animals. You know, I want that job. <laughs> you know what I mean? I want that job because animals are innocent and I, and I envy them because they're innocent. They don't have to go to alcohol treatment. They don't have those issues in life. And I really... I got kind of deep into it as a kid that they were, they were in us, they relied on us. And, and I really uh, became an animal lover with that as a kid. You know what I mean? Well, now that you brought that up, cause we are, yep. you know, we're more on the dog side, but I got a kitty right outside my door, me mewing yeah. at me. Like, cause yeah. the, gra- the rest of the garage isn't heated and where I am is. And so she's there out there. Come on. And I, yeah, she's not yeah. Really good. Cause she'd be on my lap. So let's tell the cat story. So we're going to, we, I had this in about okay. the healing part. And I'll just read yeah. the part that's in your bio and you can kind of fill us in because yep. it's a great sure. tie in and then we'll come back. So Absolutely. huge animal lover has a 10 year old Siamese cat. And what's, what's the kitty's name? We had a Priscilla. Siamese cat. Yeah. Priscilla. And the reason her name is Priscilla is because I used to have a big tuxedo cat named Elvis who meant a lot to me. And when he died and I got her, I had to do it Priscilla. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Love it. Okay. Um, and you attribute uh, Priscilla to saving you in some of your darkest moments um, and that you have a connection with her that you haven't experienced with any other animal. And I dare say probably with not very many people either. So I don't know if you want to jump into that or not, but it's a great story. And I just the power of healing and having an animal and I'll just reference, we'll come back, but this week in the next week or so, we're finishing the show with operation freedom pause. And it's a organization that matches kind of retired service dogs, police dogs, and that with veterans with PTSD. And they kind of train them together to work together on that healing process and it's been unbelievably successful since they've opened up so we're really excited to tell that story so all right tell us about priscilla just a little bit and how she saved you yeah so uh, uh she was mine and my wife's cat and my wife had uh, 21 years passed away five years ago so we're, we can talk about that later but priscilla has been with me uh, during all that and uh um yeah i told you the emotional 
a little shit. Uh, there were moments um, that I didn't want to be here tomorrow. Um, I uh, just in my by myself in my room, and uh, and her just laying on my lap and just looking at me, and literally all that was going through my head was what's going to happen to her if I take my life. Right. You know, what's going to happen to her? And she's a, <laughs> she, <laughs> she's a violent one, man. <laughs> she doesn't like anybody but me. You know what I mean? And so that's what, that's the same as our cat. <laughs> yeah. She doesn't like anybody. I mean, literally uh, people walk by her. I mean, she, she just, she's a hisser. She'll let you know. But me, uh, we have just a probably a relationship I've never had with a cat. I don't know what it is. Uh, um, she was taken away from her mom too early, which was weird. I read about it. Um, that's where a lot of them get that anger streak when she, when they, her first poop was half white. So she was still on the nipple, right? Uh, when she was, a, when she was a baby. So we, uh, we nursed her, we, you know, nurtured her and she just became my buddy. And there were moments that, uh, yeah, I, uh, I was ready to do something and, and she was just right there. You know what I mean? And I, and I was like, fuck, what, what's going to happen to her? Cause she's more important than I am. You know what I mean? And, uh, and it just kept me at least to the next day. It got me through whatever that hour may have been where I was at that dark point and uh, just her staring at me because I knew that, well, I didn't know what would happen to her. And that meant a lot more than what was going to happen to me, if that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, having one extra thing to live for and particularly something outside yourself and yeah. people, you know, if you're not an animal person, you know, then you can forgive us this yeah. conversation. You can come back later. But I mean, right. we would do that for our dogs in our weather, you know, like if you're worried yeah. about them going to the pound or somebody adopting them and all that kind of stuff. It really is enough to kind of keep you like, okay, well, if I got no other purpose in life, but to make this animal their life easier and, and keep them happy, then that's kind of enough for it. So, yeah. and, there, and there yeah, is for something that can't talk and, and give you any, yeah. you know, Hey, th this is what you need to do. This is what you need. So her just looking at me is just, I just was like my, it got into my head and was just like, I don't want to leave her alone because I don't, I don't think yeah. she'll join me. You know I mean? They'll have to put her down. Yeah. I, and, I love, no, go ahead. Well, I just, and then there's the unspoken energetic kind of communication that, that there is. And if you haven't experienced that, I guess I, all I can say is I feel sorry for you, but both yeah. you know, dogs and cats and, you know, all that, they just like being there with you. It's more than being there with you. Now this is like a story from, you know, my mom, she passed a cancer, but like in her chemo days, uh, we had a little dog named Milo, little white rat terrier. And she had, it had spread to her leg and they put a post in her leg, you know, to kind of for bone cancer, mm -hmm. trying to keep her leg on anyway. And that pup at first she didn't want it because it was kind of sore, but he would come up on purpose and sit on her lap, but he would lay over that leg all the time. Like he understood, you know what I mean? It was so yeah, crazy, isn't it? It was just, and then he would just sit there and look at her. And yeah. she told me later, you know, she was getting near the end more that those moments, like where she, he would just sit there for, you know, hour at a time and rat terry, they're all like super busy. You know, they're always wanting to be digging and doing all kinds of crazy shit. And so it's just yeah. kind of weird. You just, the things that happen in the connection there is just really powerful. Yeah. So, all there right. Was, there was, uh, sorry, but there was one moment, if you don't mind, I'm sorry. There was one moment and you reminded me of it. I was, uh, the unspoken part. I was laying there in my room and I had, um, I had a bottle of pills. Um, I used to be, uh, when I got back from Iraq, I was an IV drug user. So I know what an overdose, uh, is like, it's the, most calm way to go you know what i mean so i knew what i could do um and i was laying there and she wasn't with me and all of a sudden she just popped up on the bed and got up on my lap so it's just weird you know like that sense or what i don't care what we yeah. call it not, you know you know what i mean it's whatever it is she was right there at that right time and i put them back in the drawer and uh without her i probably would have swallowed them right Dane, my dog just walked over and sat on my foot while we're talking see, about this. See? <laughs> he's like right here. He's like, Mom, why are you emotional? Right. Yeah. No, but what yeah. I was just thinking, so uh over the summer we did an interview uh at a Mustang rescue uh ranch called Sweepo, and I'm going back through and editing all the stories and we're releasing them uh on our channel lately. And I was just like reflecting on all the memories of being there. And I mean, horses are so Oh, Dane's growling. The door guy's here. Somebody's delivering something. It's okay, buddy. Um, but but the I was just reflecting on being there and like the energy of a horse is so massive. Um, there he goes, the stoic little man. Yeah. <laughs> but either way, your point to like 
all they had to do was look at you. And I just, the whole thing that I got away from that sweet bow experience was how little we really have to do as like to assist healing for someone else. And I think we think we have to like come in with so much like great point, like Jason, like don't do it. Or you think of all this stuff and it's like, you don't have to say anything, you know? And I think people just need to be there and hold space. And I think that's such a wonderful gift that is so overlooked where it's like, you know, be an expert in this or share your story on this, or just like put out content and like always be talking. And it's like the power of listening and just holding space for people is enormous. And so, yeah, that's so right. I mean, cause I mean, when, when Jessica died, I mean, I I was, I was in bad shape, man. And, and looking back, all I needed was, there's no words. What do you say to somebody? I always said that there's no words, right? I mean, but just having somebody that I could just put my head on and scream in their ear, get pissed or yell, or just, just sit there with me. And, and I really never put it into a perspective like you just did about the, how little we have to do. And that's all my cat did is just looked at me and gave me a, you know, unconditional love that, you know, Hey, you might just need to hear me purr right now, you know, and she may not even realize she's doing it, but that's all it takes. So you're so right. That's, I don't know why we always have to feel like we have to do so much to save everybody, but you're right. I'm glad you said that. That's big. Well, and it's, I think it's an art form and it takes a certain courage not to feel, feel like you have to fill the space, you know, like I got to be an expert at this or have the right words to say and all that kind of stuff. If you can just sit and as Emma said, holding space with a loving presence and without judgment, I mean, it just goes a long way. And so if we can put our own ego aside and not have to fix anything, all it is, is a matter of being present with people. So Okay. Well, the, look at the yeah. little kitties lead. Let's kitty just talk lead. about cats all day, guys. Leads the right. People. Okay. Yeah, I know, huh? All yeah. right. Well, let's get back. So uh, let me just summarize this and I'm going to let you talk sure. about your military experience any way you want to. Okay. Sure. So I've got you 1989. Uh, th- I called it army round one. So yeah, uh, I found that. It's good. <laughs> after high school, listed in the army 1989 and went infantry. So I want to come back and at least talk to us about why you enlisted and why the army and why infantry. But anyway, and then those four years, it sounded like was primarily at Fort Wainwright, Arkansas. So that was your Alaska. duty. Yep. Or Alaska, I'm sorry, AK. Yep. 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 Okay. Yep. And then you got out in 93 and then being in Seattle, worked for seven years at Boeing. So you can talk a little bit about that. And at the yep. end of that time, so now we're about 2000, uh, Army round two. So you re-enlisted and this would have been right after, I think you were motivated or inspired after the 9-11 attacks in 2021 yep. or 2001. Am I right there? Yep. What is it? Wasn't it 2001? 2001. Yeah. They, they got me laid off. So I kind of had the idea of I'm going to go get the guys who cost me my job. Plus to use the airplanes I built. You know what I mean? Kinda yeah. That shit personal. <laughs> okay. Um, and then I know there you had a deployment there. You did Baghdad for 15 months. And then as you yep. came out around 2006, um, then you were discharged in 2007. So I guess yep. tell us a little bit about all that and why you went in and why you went back in and that kind of stuff and whatever you want to share about your deployment. Cool. Um, so yeah, coming out of high school, I didn't, I didn't know what I was going to do, you know, and, uh, my dad was air force. Uh, he always said that, uh, he was the for, for surveillance photographer in the belly of the B-52 when we weren't in Vietnam. He used to always say that, you know what I mean? Before we were over there. So, uh, I was ready to join. Yeah, exactly. I was ready to join the air force. Um, quite literally I flew to Denver. Um, cause you know, my dad was going to start getting me ready. I went in and took my ASVAB, did everything, but raised my hand and take the oath, you know, got all ready for air force. Uh, I had the job picked out. To this day, I don't remember what the job I picked out I was going to do, but I fly back to Seattle to get my affairs in order, planned on flying back to Denver and leave for basic training from there as an, as an airman. I come down to uh, the written uh, station where they have the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine recruit, right? Waiting on the Air Force guy. And because he's late, I look across the hall and the Army guy, the Army recruiter, happened to graduate with my brother. And I still remember his name, Van Lewin, played football with my brother. And he was a recruiting. He's like, John, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm over here waiting for the Air Force recruiter, you know? And I said, well, come here. And he showed me a video, uh, like a good recruiter should, right? Yep. He showed me a video right. of infantry. And I went, man, I want to blow shit up. <laughs> that's, that's what I want to do. Uh, little did I know when I took my um, the ASVAB test that combat operations was my highest area of scoring. So it was meant to be. Um, so my dad was like, well, I'm glad you're joining, but you could have saved me a lot of money in airfare if you just went out and joined, you know? I was like, that's fair, dad, you know? Uh, but went to basic, um, listen, I'd never, uh, like I said, I left a, a chaotic house, you know what I mean? Four boys pretty much raising our spells. Um, my discipline was my older brothers beating me up when I didn't do what they, you know, I was the remote control back in the day. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Go turn the channel. Um, so I go 
And Army, I embraced it because that dress right dress attitude, everything's where it's supposed to be, when it's supposed to be there. Uh, it, it was like, man, this is easier. I, I like this. You know what I mean? And and I fell in love with it. And the Army was good to me. I, I'd never shot a weapon before I joined the Army, just a BB gun in the woods playing with boys, right? Um, listen to what the drill sergeants say. And the next thing you know, when I get up to Fairbanks, Alaska, I was the two-time uh, uh, 6th Infantry Division marksmanship champion, you know? Um, I found out I could put a round up a six ass from a thousand meter, right? And uh, uh, never knew I never knew I could, but I just listened to the basics of what the drill sergeant taught me how to do uh, with the M16, and uh, yeah, I fell in love with it. I got up to Alaska. Um, I started excelling, so I, I it, it pumped my chest up because I, I was somebody, you know what I mean? Where I wasn't when I was at home, I was just the younger, annoying younger brother and and the kid in the shadow, right? Well, when I get up to Alaska, I mean, I'm, we do our, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the EIB training, the expert infantry badge. The CIB is the one you get when you're going to combat, but the EIB is a series of like 63 tests you have to do that are all infantry related. And it's over like a three day period, right? And it ends with a PT test and a 25 mile road march. But throughout it, you have to disassemble and reassemble your M16. You have to throw a hand grenade. You have to put up a claymore mine and do that. You have to night land navigation, day land navigation. So you have to go through all these tasks and you can only get i think it's three no-goes but you have to retest those to get goes if you get any double no-go you're out or if you get four no-goes you know you're out so and if you get them all the first time through they call it true blue and i got true blue i hit every me and my buddy tom brodkin who ended up being a long time still is a great dear friend of mine um we just were going through the tasks as privates because we had the attitude of great let's just get this shit over with so we can get back i don't you know probably not going to get this thing. Well, by day two, we have all goes. We're looking at each other like, shit, we're going to get this, you know? Um, and out of a brigade, you got like 12 guys getting the EIB. That's how hard it is. So I'm a private. And one of the, one of the glory points was when we were doing day land navigate or night land navigation, you start off just before, the, uh, you know, it gets dark. And all that my mindset was get out there, get in the woods, get your points and get the hell back. There's bears out in this woods. You know what I mean? Just hurry up and get back. It's cold. I literally set my azimuth, ran, got my three points, did my thing, came running back across the uh, finish line. And there was our command sergeant major was standing off in the corner when they yelled out the time. And he goes, what was that time? And I'm like, I'm a private. I'm like, shit, what did I do wrong? You know, you go right to the negative, right? And he comes over and he goes, check his points. And I got all my points right. And well, I, apparently I'd set the 6th Infantry Division night land navigation record for time and like blew it out of the water yeah. right and they even gave me an arcom for it i was like i wasn't even trying i just wanted to get off the force <laughs> it, was, it was my intentions were not to get an award you know what i mean i wanted just to running from bears just running from exactly bears. just running from bears you know? <laughs> um so uh, my point of that is literally it just it happened for me and and i loved it man but i i i got married um had kids. Uh, I always joke, say it was cold in Alaska because my kids are 29, 30, and 31. <laughs> there, was, there was nothing else to do, right? Um, and so, but then my, I let my wife at the time talk me, <laughs> yeah, talk me into getting out of the army and going home, not raising army brats and everything. And I let her talk me out of it. Well, I come home after a, a great four year tour. I was ready to re enlist, you know, and, and stay in. Um, I get a job at Boeing and she divorced us. So that, that's, that's normal, right? Yeah. Um, so I get divorced. I'm working for Boeing. Um, but I have three great kids, you know, three great kids. So, um, can I, I just, let yep, me, yep. I just want to weave this yep. in and you can respond anytime. Absolutely. I just, you know, a common story that we get though, when guys and or women, it goes both directions when they leave the military. So they lose the military identity, the role, the camaraderie and all that stuff. And yep. then when they come out, then the family thing, doesn't work out for whatever reason, military, yep. otherwise, whatever. And Good now point. all of a sudden they've lost two of the most important cornerstones of their entire life. And there's this sense of just kind of being lost. Like, you know, I don't have the, I don't have the military structure now or the satisfaction or the rank or the, you know, all the things that come with being in the military and being good at your job and loving it. Yep. And then now you lose your family and that you just yep. feel like a spinning top out in trying to rework into the civilian life. And it, it seems to be super kind of, I don't know, disarming for people and that. So just kind of in your story, I'm hearing that. So just maybe touch on that as you're going through this, because that transition, those seven years, I mean, that, that's a tough thing to go through as you're doing that. Yeah. It, it's funny you say, cause I, until recently, you know, I mean, I really never thought about that as being affecting me, but you know, it's no different than when I got out this last time. I mean, it, it I lost 
something that, I mean, cause I went from one extreme to the next in the military where I was somebody and I, I was succeeding and I was great and I get out and yeah, I get a job at Boeing, but you know, it wasn't what I left. And then when she divorced me, I mean, now the Boeing, which is a great job, I would say Boeing working for Boeing in the Northwest up here is the greatest job for someone who, if you just have your high school diploma and you don't want to go to college because you can, you can provide a great life for your family there. You know what I mean? It's a great union job. Uh, and you get a lot of time off, you know, for your family, they really, it's a great company. Um, but you have to make it through the ups and downs, the layoffs, the, the strikes and all that kind of stuff, you know? Um, but even working at Boeing, you're right. I wasn't as happy as I was when I was at Fairbanks, you know, nowhere near. Um, and I tried to be, but it just wasn't that. I mean, I, I was a good employee, you know, showed up every day, but there wasn't that, you know, glory of being a, an infantry man, being an infantryman, something special, bro. The blue cord, blue cord brotherhood. It is, uh, it, it, yeah, we always joke. There's two jobs in the army, the infantry and everyone else who supports us. You know what I mean? That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, we were the elite of the army, you know, and I was very proud of that. Um, so yeah, it is funny because that did affect me a lot, probably not even realizing it did until, till now that I'm older looking back. So, um, but then nine 11 happened. And, okay that uh i saw and i know I, I first off at boeing i was working uh and you, i know you don't know the cities but everett is way far north i was working there at the triple seven i worked on the triple seven it was a brand new plane at the time and when i got divorced i transferred to the renton site which was on the three the 737 which was closer and less of a commute uh knocked off about 40 miles you know what i mean of my commute every day so that way i could spend more time with the kids um well when i went to renton i met jessica um who ended up being, you know, the love of my life. Uh, she was, uh, yeah, she was one of the most beautiful people I ever met in my life. Um, and there's somebody who made me feel like I was something special. Because when I went in, I saw this beautiful, I lived my story. She loved hearing this story. I'd, I get there my first day and uh, I'm in, you know, meet my trainer. We're walking to, we get to our, our shop. We're getting ready to go. Uh, we have our morning meeting, introduce Jason, new guy. We're going over to our shop. We had to go down these stairs and across over to the, to the work at work site and uh, get down to the bottom of the stairs. And uh, the dude that's training me, I stopped dead in my tracks. <laughs> training me keeps walking. He looks back and he goes, what are you doing? I was like, who is that? <laughs> Cause there's just over with her back to me. She had this big, beautiful blonde curly hair and she just was just gorgeous and he goes oh that's jessica she's high maintenance i said i don't care what you say she is i just want to be next to her she is beautiful <laughs> you know what i mean i don't care what you say she is and so i didn't chase after I'm a, I'm a divorced guy with kids and child support and she's you know a few years younger than me and she's single i was like she don't want nothing to do with me so and what turns out is is she the, the thing that attracted me because I didn't chase after her. I wasn't trying to, you know, the, all the Neanderthals that worked in the factory, you know what I mean? Um, and so that attracted her to me and she ended up kind of chasing me down. And, um, yeah, she was, uh, one of the best things that ever happened in my life. Um, but, uh, nine 11 happened. And the reason hey, I that listen, was, I, I just want to, yeah. you know, having a moment where you have found the love of your life, and and I just yeah, wanna, I guess it's not worth just moving right by, is it? That's oh, we love love. We, <laughs> no, we love we, love. Like, yeah. Talk about yeah. it more. <laughs> we love love. And I, I just want to, yeah. you know, in your connection and attachment and the way she filled you and inspired you and loved you. I mean, those are those are rare things for people. And so, I, I mean, I just I, I want to like a picture of her is what I'm doing. OK. There's the big Jessica. hair. All right. And she hang on a second. She just was amazing. This is her at her parents house. Just this, <laughs> I'm telling. I was. I don't. I always just say I don't know what she saw in me, but I'm sure the fuck glad she saw it. <laughs> well, <laughs> so anyway, I just want to. I want to say thank you for sharing that, and just uh, it's okay. I mean, hold that memory and uh, cherish it because yeah. th there are people who go through their whole lives and uh, don't ever never have that feeling. And so coach. it's a it's a great thing, and I really appreciate you sharing that. And feel free, crying yep. here is okay. Love is okay here. Pain yep. is okay. So. I, uh, I have to say on that note, you know, I, I always tell people, you know, when you tell somebody you love them, you, you know, in your heart, you know how much you love somebody, but do you really know how much when somebody says it back to you truly, you know what I mean? Well, when she said it back to me after, you know, 10 years, we were together I and mean, we ended up being together 21. I, I knew when she said, I love you, Jason, it was just like me saying, I love you, Jessica. I knew exactly that it was just, yeah, 
It was just like it. And so I, I, I at one point thought, I'm okay with being alone for the rest of my life because I felt a love that first time I'm never going to feel again, probably. Um, but I was okay because I felt something just like you said, coach, that not many people really get their true feel, man. So she may have left me early, but uh, she gave me 21 years of something that a lot of people will never get to feel. All right. Well, this cool this story just keeps getting. This is the best. Yeah. You're winding, man. We got a windy road here. This is all right. Listen, you know, uh. I, 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 I jumping ahead. I, I get blown away this last this last month, especially. Coach has been a fucking whirlwind for me because I'm just a guy in my mind. I'm just a dude that was in the infantry, um, and everybody tells me, you know what, your story is amazing, and I think that I'm just a, I'm just another guy. You know, how how is my story just amazing? So. Um, I'm starting to hear it, I guess, for the first time. Yeah. I never listened to my story before. So that, yeah. that's the difference now. I'm, I'm starting to listen to it. Well, good. And I, I hope if yeah. in any way that you helping share your story on this podcast yeah. in any way helps facilitate that, I Amen. think it's a great thing. So it's, yeah. I think, you know, and I think that's really true. I think when people don't get a chance to tell their story, because, you know, the brain tends to minimize and or focus on the negative, And we never give ourselves enough credit yeah, for the no. things that we did do. And no, I screwed that up or all that kind of stuff. And so when you say it out loud, though, and then you have people around you and they respond in a way like, dude, that's amazing. Like, I can't believe yeah. you survived that or whatever. It's like, yeah. huh, wow. You know, maybe maybe me being the best I could be in that moment, maybe that was pretty fucking good. You know what I mean? Yeah, and like, and just, yeah I do know exactly what you And mean. being able just yeah. to hear that and let it soak in and let all the judgment and like all the questions and all the way your mind kind of fucks with you just letting all that shit go, you know? And so yeah. anyway, so great. Yeah. This, cause you got all kinds of pieces yeah. here, you know, between yeah. your dad and, you yeah. know, getting a divorce and then now, you know, with all these pieces. So you, there's, there's little T's building on big T's here. So anyway, we, we yes, appreciate you sharing those yeah. with us. So, okay. Absolutely. Well, we're rolling. Okay. Nine 11 then. Okay. We're, yep. Wrap us into that. So uh nine 11 happened, of course, um, Boeing, I remember I was working at the plant and they came down and I was, you know, doing some insulation work in the inside of the 3-7 and they were like, man, dude, so some plane, probably like a Cessna or some shit, flew into the Twin Towers, you just come down to the break room and check this out. You know, we had a little TV in the break room and a bunch of us put our tools down, we go running down there, we're like, damn, that's that's a big freaking fire for a, for a Cessna, you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden, just like the rest of the world, wham, it's, it hits the second building and we're like, what the fuck was that? Right. Um, and I. I think it was literally after the Pentagon got attacked that I realized this, this, this is, is not, you know, this is something, this isn't an accident. This is a planned attack. And so everyone at Boeing, they were like, you guys go home, everybody go home, get home as fast as you can. It was like, there was an earthquake in, in, uh, in, uh, in Renton though, because everyone, the roads were packed. People were just trying to get to their families. It was, I literally parked my car cause I lived on, I walked home because it was just, I wasn't getting out of the parking lot. It was, it was insane. Um, and, uh, Went home and, and I remember uh, they gave us like, you know, four days off uh, paid because they knew, you know, first off, they were starting to lay people off and everything. But anyway, when they did lay off, I found myself uh, staying up late at night because, you know, our, our lovely press followed our, our soldiers into the uh, invasion and um, I didn't sleep. I was watching it all. I was stuck to the TV. Um, pissed. Pissed off. Um, you know, they attacked us. Um, I know what people felt like in the Pearl Harbor, but it was worse because there were civilians that, that got attacked. It wasn't a military installation that got attacked. Um, cost me my job. And so there was a lot of it. And I, you know, America built, a, or the government said, okay, you know what, if you, you choose a job after you've, you've been laid off because of 9-11, if you choose a job that's, you know, in, in demand, we'll pay for your schooling. We'll give you mass, max unemployment for as long as your schooling takes. And it was a big deal to push for that. And I had that option. And uh, I turned to Jess and I'm like, that isn't good enough. I got, I got to do something. I was a damn good infantry soldier. I mean, I was fucking good. I loved it, but I had a blank adapter on the end of my weapon. So I wanted to make sure I could do it without it and do it the real way, you know, do it and, and do what I do what I was taught. And my brothers were like, dude, it's been 10 years, you know, like, well, what are you thinking? And I'm like, well, thinking I can do this because I'm 36, but I'm still in great shape. You know, they were calling me grandpa over there, but I beat them in the PT test and shut their little asses up. <laughs> so, um, but it was, uh, I'm glad I went over more mature. You know what I mean? I was able to be an older guy for the younger kids. I mean, we had, I was, uh, I was with the Hawaiian unit. I had kids that had never been off the Hawaiian island. They saw snow for the first time in Germany when we landed, you know? So I'm glad I went over a little older, but I, I looked at Jess and I said, I gotta, I gotta go back. And 
she uh, she told me, if you don't, you won't be yourself. And so she supported me. And that's, whoo, fuck. Um, to be able to tell somebody, go to war and be okay with it, whether she was or not in her head. Uh, she made me feel like she was, um, but she knew what it was doing for me. And talk about support. You know, I told her, I said, look, there's only two kinds of soldiers that die in combat, but it's your time, it's your time. Uh, going home from this podcast, my car could get hit by a truck. We don't know. And when it's your time, it's your time. But I said, the other one is the, the kind of soldier that does something stupid and accelerate the process. So I will promise you, I won't die stupid. That's all I can promise you. I won't die stupid. And, uh, and I came home and she was good with that. Uh, you know, um, over there, I got that feeling alive feeling again, uh, with the adrenaline of, of it being real though. Now, um, AJ, I just want to, let me, I don't yep. want to interrupt at all, but you know, nope. I just came across this quote that has really just resonated with me just because I've always like fallen outside the lines of normal society for the most part, which is, yeah. you know, one of the reasons MVP is kind of special to me because like everybody there is kind of, but there's a little, it, the saying is like the things that make me different are the things that make me me. Yeah. And, and yeah. No if shit. you, if you can find someone that can support you in that, and can still love you, even though the differences, you know, make it, you know, kind of tough and a little weird nope. and, or a group of people. I mean, that's the beauty of the military. That's the beauty of MVP. And for me, it was the beauty of sports teams and football, you know, that as long as you had this common goal and this focus, those other, you know, weirdness or whatever you want to call it, yeah, you know, they were kind of all absorbed because the rest of it was all okay. You know? And so yeah, being, you a, just, being an outcast was all right. Yeah, it was okay. It was just yep. kind of part, you know, we all, we, everybody had a little bit of a streak in them and it was understood. Yep. And so, you know, for you to tell that story about Jess and to be there together and for her to be able to look at you and for her to say that, I mean, to Dude. say, look, if you don't go, you're not going to be you. And yep. even though that the you that she's describing is a little bit crazy and a little bit wild and a little bit out there, but that, that she recognizes the power of, you know, the, and the need to be able to be you authentically. Yep. And to affirm that, I mean, dude, that that's fucking amazing. So, I mean, I just want to kind of name that because people go their whole life, you know, and uh, like, and just the way you fit into the army, even that, you know, just by kind of circumstance and just falling into it, yep. that's a great feeling. And so, all those things, and for her to recognize that, and yep. to uh, to wish you well, and to go back to it, and so that's why we kind of honor the differences and try to embrace them in a way. Then, as long as we're not hurting people too badly, you know, try to yeah. let people be themselves. You know, I think learning how not to be afraid to be yourself yep. and surrounding yourself with people that are okay with it, I think is just kind of a lifelong chore. So anyway, Absolutely. okay. Absolutely. All right. So no, that's a very good point. And now you're yeah. back in. Okay. Roll it. Okay. Yeah. So I, uh, literally I had to hunt, uh, for the unit that was getting ready to deploy. Cause I, and I found out that uh, the national guard was the fastest way over. If I joined the regular army, um, I had to end up getting transferred to a unit that may not go. So my best advice from the recruiter was if I joined the national guard, I could actually link in with a unit that's actually getting ready to deploy, which happened to be the Hawaiian national guard. So this is the funny story. So I actually joined the Washington national guard and researched and found my own way over across the, uh, the water. I didn't actually go, but I contacted their command and was like, you guys need more people. Yes. And I said, I want to do an interstate transfer is what they call it. So I basically had to take the oath. You know, when you take the oath to join the, the regular army, you take it to the nation, right, to the president. But when you take it to the National Guard, you you take the oath to your governor because it's run by the state. So I had to take the oath over the phone to the Hawaii National Guard. And I literally met up with my unit in Kuwait because when I joined, they were down training in uh, Arkansas at JRTC. And I met them in Kuwait. They had gotten there two days before me. And so if you can imagine, loudmouth Howie Jason. Walking into the walking into the tent, and they're all chilling, playing their ukuleles on their uh, computers. And I thought, what the fuck did I get myself into? <laughs> this is not going to be good. Thank God they played football the next morning for PT because the Hawaiians love their football, and I played good football, so fit in right in. Got got to be part of the family. Thank God, and uh, they welcomed me uh, because uh, they they they're so chill behind the lines, but when you get them outside the wire. Uh, uh, the aggressive part of them is, is what kept us all alive. You know, we didn't take no shit and I was really glad they were on my side, you know? <laughs> um, I got over there with the Hawaiian dudes. Uh, and, um, we, I think the, the biggest point for me was when we were sitting in Kuwait and they started issuing us our live rounds and I'm loading them into the magazine. And that was my aha moment. Like, oh shit, I just signed on that. I had this talk, this big talk, you know what I mean? I want to go over there and fight. 
guess what? <laughs> Careful what you you are. You're, you're loading live rounds, buddy. <laughs> there ain't no blank adapter at the end of your F-16. And um, got on the plane, C-130. We're flying up. We're halfway there. The plane goes blackout. And get blackout, meaning I can't even see the dudes across the other side of the C-130. And the plane's like this. And all of a sudden, it, instead of just coming in for a landing like that, it goes and down. Because they got combat. They're as high altitude as they can. Pilot drops it, nosedive, pulls it up just to land on the thing. That way you're not coming in slowly and you're a target, right? So you're flipped sideways and you hit the ground and you're like, holy shit. And, it's, uh, and it, that's when they're really, you know, you're, you're here. And uh, got out. We got to our, our little holding area um, and you start hearing firefights off in the distance. And then you know it's real. And But it's funny. You adapt into that so much faster than you adapt coming out because the survival kicks in. You're like, okay, I know my, your training, all that stuff that they taught you in basic, you, you thought, oh, I'm never going to use this stuff. It all just resurfaces. Bam, 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 bam. The, file, the files all open up and start reloading all that information you were taught. You know? And because uh, I will remember the first time I ever fired a weapon at, at a human, it was my, I don't remember my mind thinking about anything. It just happened. It was like I had been training my whole life because uh, it's, that's why they drill it in so much into you in the military over and over. So the muscle memory literally hadn't gone away 10 years later, you know? Um, and that first time I was up in the 50 cal and we're doing a patrol. Um, and I loved being up in the front with 50 cal cause I, I wasn't trigger shy. I wasn't, uh, I mean, I, I felt like I was more in charge of my life too. I wasn't in the back seat hoping the guy upstairs, you know, up in the gun, you know, shoots first and doesn't wait, you know, some stupid shit like that and ends up getting us in trouble. Um, we had a, we called them, <clears throat> they were bongo trucks and they're these goofy little cab over flatbeds that the Iraqis carry. Dude, you put two cows on the back of that thing. They move around. It was bizarre what they did. Right. So he comes around the bend. It's broad daylight. We're actually heading back after the, our patrol. We're actually heading home. We're kind of done for the day. And these two cars come around the bend and it's broad daylight. Uh, the roads are really thin, uh, black tops and I'm in the front and I'm waving my hands and the other cars they were taught, we, you know, if you see a military, uh, you know, vehicles, just pull over and they won't shoot at you. That was put all over the, the TV and the media there in Iraq. You know, if you just pull over, we're going to go right by. Uh, so the two, one car pulled over and I gave the other one a chance to pass because I figured he didn't have time. But he didn't pull over after he passed it. And I was like, oh, and I hear my buddy, shoot. And I and he kept coming, kept close. So I just lifted up my 50 count. We, I used to load the 50 with the first six rounds tracer. Um, that way, because a 50 cal, you're not down behind it like this. You're up on it like this, right? You got to see where those first ones are going. Then it's every fifth one is a tracer route. So you can see where the bullets are going. Yep. So the first six were tracer and I could see where they go. And they skipped right off the ground into the bottom of the bongo. And I saw the front of it lift up and it disabled it. And he went into the ditch. Well, little did we know. I mean, we ended up, you know, zip tying him and taking him in. But he had his whole trunk was uh, the whole back of it was full of propane tanks wired for sound, if you know what I mean. And so. Uh, yeah, I took it out. And that was the first time I'd ever fired a, a, a bullet at a human. Um, and um, at the time, your adrenaline's going so fucking much. But I didn't even think. It just, bam, popped those rounds, you know? That's what had to happen. And um, it wasn't until I got home, or I'm home, <laughs> back to the our, our, nice. our bunk, and yeah. was laying there, and I was like, fuck. That just happened. I, I fired at somebody before I ever got the first bullet fired at me. You know, that happened later in our two. But um, that was... Uh, yeah, that was a moment. And I didn't even kill anybody. That was a moment, you know? Um, yeah. Did they, did they teach you? So curious. Just picturing you in that moment, like the adrenaline and just like the physiological reaction. I'm getting bumped up right now. My chest. Yeah, I can tell. So I can high tell. High right <laughs> I can tell. Also, I'm wondering, I'm so, like, yes, did, yeah. in any training, yeah. were they like, okay, after you come back and you're so hyped up, like, do these breathing exercises or like go for a walk no, or like do no, anything? Like, no. like, how do you... Nope. manage i mean guys are hyped the way it is and like get them all together and then give them some guns so like we talked about animal this is the best the one the energy about, right? <laughs> you ever watch the animal planet and you ever see a couple of lions fight yes for their pride so when the one lion wounds it goes off and lays around and then that the one that won all he's doing is pacing back and forth and you can see that he's sweating he's just trying to let that energy out that's pretty much what it was we got back to the base took off our gear we we're supposed to go in and have a our debriefing and everything, but that wasn't happening for about 15, 20 minutes. We all paced around and especially me, I had to let some adrenaline just naturally. And I guess I did mindfulness with not even thinking about it. I had to pace and, uh, and just kind of let it, uh, let it soak out, I guess, and let it leave. Yeah. Me Cause, um, yeah, it was pretty intense. 
How tall are you? Six, six, two. So that was the other thing. I'm big dude. Okay. Yeah. I'm sticking out the top of that turret, but I I, I went over with the mindset of if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Don't be scared of that moment. If it bring me a gunshot, because that's, what's going to get me killed without it being my time. Um, so I really went outside the wire when I kept telling myself every time, don't be worried if there's a pile of garbage on the side of the road. I mean, cause, and I just, I got it. If you're going to take me, just make sure it happens like that. You know what I mean? Don't, don't make me suffer, please. You know what I mean? I'm doing the right thing. I volunteered to come over here. That's the least you could do if it happens to me. You know what I mean? Um, and so I just went into that with that mindset, kind of psyched myself out, uh, to, if it just in case it happened that way, I, I never anticipated, I tried never to anticipate it. There were moments, you know, that, you know, we call it the pucker factor, you know, when you're, when your butt pucker so tight that air won't even move, you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, there were those moments, but I really, uh, I just kept telling myself that don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. If it happens, it's going to happen. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. You know? Yeah. So, just do your, stay present and do your job. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's really what um, it comes into. Yeah. Yeah. The first, the first time we got shot at was a, I call it my, uh, my John Wayne moment. <laughs> I was, uh, it's actually kind of funny. So we, we were on a patrol. It was one of our first foot patrols. And we went through this, what you could equivalent to an apple orchard. You know what I mean? We're walking through and it's just dusty as fuck. You can imagine it's hot, sweating. And when I get out, when we get out, everybody's taking the knee. And I, I had to undo my chin strap and I had to take my glove and wipe off all the dust and everything that had made it through onto my face. And so the medic had taken a picture of me and I, and I still have it. I'm standing there. I got my weapon slung, my chin straps hanging open. And everybody says I look like John Wayne, got a grenade hanging off me. And the bullet flew. You could hear it hit the trees. So everyone else took a knee. So the fucker was aiming at me, probably because my dumb ass didn't take a knee. And I heard it all. And that's when I took a knee. But the medic, had, I got a picture of me standing there. And the big joke was, OK, way to go, John Wayne. You know what I mean? Yeah. With the chin strap hanging down and all that stuff. But that was the first time um, that that happened. And then, you know, that never happened again. The chin right. strap. <laughs> you, you yeah, got I'm going to take a knee. I'm going to take a knee. pass on that one. I got a pass. I got a pass. Yeah, exactly. I got a pass. All right. Um, well, send us that photo. Yeah. I, I feel like we need to see it. Yeah. I got, uh, right, listen, now, as, well, as we're talking, I'll look at I got her here. I, I call it my love me picture. Um, so I had my, our medic made uh, pictures here. And it's, uh, yeah, my I love me picture. That's what it's called is when, uh, where did it go? I know. Um, anyway, uh, it's not there. Um, yeah, you can just send it, you, it? You, you can send, shoot it to us later. Yeah, I don't have to do it. Yeah, I don't hold up. I, if I would have found it right away, it'd been great. Anyway, I'll send it to you guys. You can put it on the thing. It's it's actually a really cool picture of the. Uh, we called it the Bless Humvee. It's a it's a shadow picture of me up in the turret. You can see the the outline of the Humvee with the fifty cal, and then you can see the outline of me. Really cool picture. And then there's other pictures put on top of it of different moments over there in Iraq. So we call it a, the I Love You picture, and, and I have it. It's really cool. I'll send it to you guys. So. But great. that picture's in there. The John Wayne is in there. So <laughs> Okay. Um, I knew there was something about you. Were, I mean, we had a right. We had a lot of uh, you know, I love talking about the fun times that we had. We're working at the gate. Oh, I we were lucky enough, my platoon, we were down in the green zone right away, which sucked. It's uh basically the central uh, you know, you've saw in the news all the the crossed uh, swords in, in Iraq, you saw those. Those are down in the green zone, that's the capital. Um, I hated being down there cause we were down there with a bunch of those blackwater dudes that seen too many Steven Seagal movies, you know what I mean? And, uh, we just hated being around those guys. They were, they were cowboys and, and that's not what I was about, but we, we were chosen. They took one of our platoons to go up to what they called the RPC, the Rodwania palace complex, which was a, a SF Navy seal compound. And we were like, man, we're going to go on this compound. These guys are the elite, what do you know, but they needed people to do their gates, their towers and outer patrol to protect the base so that they could do their job. Um, and it was a pretty cool place to be actually, if I had to be there, uh, the palaces were just like an Aladdin cartoon. They were amazing inside. Um, and yeah. And then of course, 200 yards away, mud huts where people are living. So that was, mm -hmm. strong, so, but, uh, that base was pretty cool. Um, uh, we got a lot of, uh, cool intel. We got to do some pretty cool patrols with those guys. Um, but when we're working the gates, um, had a couple, we worked with Iraqi nationals that were, that had, you know decided to fight for their country. The few of them that did, you know, we respected them because at least they stood up and put on a uniform and they'd work with us, you know, and, uh, everybody, uh, the Iraqis think we're all cowboys and they think we're all, you know, rich and all that kind of stuff. That's their impression of America. Right. Um, so I got one of them, uh, learned how to say, how y'all doing? Just like that. Right. With that, uh, Southern accent. And a dude pulled up to the gate. He was a contractor 
lifter with a cowboy hat on. So I had Ali walk up to the cow- to the, the gate before he lifted the pole and go, how y'all doing? And that dude about pissed himself. He's like, what? <laughs> 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 and uh, he didn't know why I interacted with talking like that. But those are the fun moments that you always, you know, you cherish those moments because they, they take you away from the chaos of, right. of combat, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Kind of fill the space. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the, the yeah, there's a brotherhood as you know, you know, like no other over there, you know, I mean, I have three brothers, um, that were blood related, but, um, I never had to rely on one of those to to make sure I stayed alive by watching my back. So that brotherhood's a little different, you know? Um, yeah, I guess, uh, um, I never talked about it until I went into therapy, but I can tell you about uh, the moment that really, uh, set me over. Um, we were, uh, uh, out on patrol and our back gun, uh, had reported back that a car was following us with every turn we took. And I was like, okay, you know, when the, our squad leader was like, all right, well, let's, we'll turn here. We'll turn here. See if he keeps following us. And he did. And so we reported. So what we did is I was dismount that day and we sped up, took a corner. The three of us hopped out. The driver and the gunner went up, took a left. The other uh, Humvees came around. We called them, you know, Victor one, Victor two for vehicle one and vehicle two, three and four. And when vehicle four came around the corner, if that vehicle came around the corner behind us, because a lot of times they trailed us to see where we were going so they could set up IEDs, uh, they could see where our, we never took the same route twice. That was you're asking for trouble if you ever took the same route twice, because they would monitor where we went, you know, and they did it in civilian. You know, we were fighting a civilian uniform. We weren't fighting uniforms when I got there, you know. So this guy kept following us and, and he came around the corner, uh, Spurka. And my squad leader were on the other side, and I took a knee behind the car on the other side of the street. So when he came around the corner, we kind of had him like this. Um, Sergeant White put his hand up. Spurka did a little burst, and the car stopped. Um, then it started to roll again. So Spurka lit it up and hit it. And uh, at that time, he had killed the driver. Um, the car came to a creeping halt. We're like, all right, so whatever, man. You know, life happens. And, you know, uh, Sergeant White goes, all right, let's a- approach cautiously. You know, and then we're walking up. Um, I'm still kind of down. He's starting to walk up and I see a head poke up over the passenger side and I yell, you know, body, you know, person. And he kind of takes a knee and then the head up pops up again and I zeroed in. And as soon as I saw forehead, I took the shot and I took him down and I was like, all right, we're safe now. You know, let's keep moving cautiously, walk up there. And, uh, when I walked up, it was, a, it was a kid. Yeah. So, uh, I struggled with that a lot. Um, I used the age eight because it was about that age. Um, after counseling, uh, wow, well, not even as emotional as I used to be, um, which is good. That means healing's happening. Um, uh, I had to get it in my head that he was training. His, you know, I had to get put it in my head. He was training this kid. You know, why would you have your son with you when you're doing what you're doing, dude, unless you were training him? Because they used kids. Um, they would put kids in bikes with bombs in them and send them to the gate. They knew Americans, you know, you're not going to shoot a kid or a woman, right? That's, you know, we value life. Um, when it comes to, you know, the soldier's not just going to shoot an unarmed kid, but if the bike's, uh, you know, wired for sound, then, you know, he's, we're, we're vulnerable to it, you know? And, uh, so he was probably being taught and he was cruising along with dad, uncle, whatever the fuck he was to him. But, uh, that, that haunted me for a long time. Um, probably cause that, you know what, you know, the crazy shit that went through my head was going back to when I told you I was a marksmanship competition and I wish, I wish I wasn't a good shot. Maybe I would have missed. You know what I mean? Um, that's the kind of shit your brain does to you. You know, you start, you know, you start, you know, it's kind of like dreams. Why do we have these weird dreams? Your brain just starts asking these questions that really don't need to be asked. You know, um, nope. of course, I mean, I'm a, I'm a good shot because it probably kept me alive and it kept my spot alive for a lot longer than, you know, more it did than this one incident, you know, but your mind tells you that that's a reason why um, this happened. So you're a bad person. Here. You know, um, it's war. You know, it took me a long time. Uh, before I even talked about it when it came back. Right. Well, Jay, that's, well, I know you've, you've worked with Susie on it and you're doing your thing with it. So, yep. but, um, you know, cause if you don't take the shot though, it could have been somebody else. Or even if it was still, even if with an eight year old or 10 year old, yep. they still know how to blow things up. And I had know, a guy tell me, he goes, how many, why don't you look at it this way? How many lives in the future did you save right. by taking out a potential terrorist? Maybe you saved, a hundred American lives because this guy was turned was his destined to be this and he was gonna be a bomber or whatever. You know, so you don't know, you yeah. know, what you did. You may have done something very, very big and very good here. So um that took a lot of therapy <laughs> to get to that right. point. You know what I mean? 
Well, and I'm glad I did. That, that was what that was what the PTSD program did for me. Is as I allowed me not to drink it away, and actually talk about it like I'm doing right now. Right. Well, we do the very best we can in the moments that we're faced with. Yep. You know what I mean. Yep. And you rely on your training and what you were taught and the things that you did. Yep. And like yeah, said, looking back, I did nothing wrong. I mean, like one guy said, he goes, "Did you wake up in the morning going, you know what? It's Tuesday. I think I'm going to go shoot a kid today." You know, no, nobody no, woke up no. and did. You know, I went out to do my job, and unfortunately. Uh, my job ended up entailing something like that happening, you know, right. and then, yeah. Well, and I think, we, you know, we, oh. or I was just going to say, I so appreciate you sharing that with us. Cause yeah. I think there is a lot of people who can't talk about those moments and who don't yep. want to, and their yep. brains are still kind of putting them in this cage or this prison of you killed a kid or you did something yep. wrong. And in the, you know, and I think when you don't have those resources or, like the PTSD program that you're talking about, or maybe they're not a part of MVP, like those thoughts haunt them on a regular basis. Yeah. And so oh, to, to I, be able I to had, share it is. Yeah, yeah. I had shitty dreams where I'd wake up and it was my son's face. I'd walk up to the car and it'd be my son laying there. You know, that's what your brain does. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah, why, why do we torture ourselves like that? You know, and that's, I didn't do it on purpose, but yeah. Right. I don't even, I don't get it. And there's no, there's no answer to that, but that's what was happening to me, you know? So, and I just want to name too the you you did your own reframe right in the middle of you telling that story. I don't know if you recognized it or not. You made an acknowledgement to yourself right at the beginning. I'm not quite as emotional as I usually have been telling the story. Right. So there's some healing going on. And then later you started talking about you know just being able to talk about it and the repetition of speaking it out loud. The more we can name it and utter those words, the more we take the power away from those words and that image. To, to haunt us in that kind of way. And so, so anyway, a lot of spin there. And so whoever you're working yeah. with, they're, they're doing some great stuff and you're, yeah, that's hard uh, work that PTSD, it is that PTSD program. I mean, really, I mean, first off I'd gotten sober first, you know what I mean? Cause I, I, I came back and, and I turned, I mean, uh, IV drug user, uh, uh, we can get into Jess dying later on, but I mean, uh, then I drank like a fish. And so having long-term sobriety, you know, I had, you know, I, I put myself into four months. So well, not put myself, but I went into four months of uh, treatment before transferring to the PTSD, which was uh, not planned, but it ended up being the, the best thing because I had a lot more clarity, you know, than walking into a PTSD program as my first, you know, source of getting better. And I was able, and I was ready to start opening, you know, pulling back the band-aids and actually working on the wounds instead of just uh, covering them up, you know? Yeah. Well, let's, and I don't want to cut your story short, but I do want to nope. honor time too. So talk yeah. to us. And so after the 15 months in Baghdad, then yep. you come back, you're in about a year and then around 2007, then I believe you yep. discharge. So maybe if you're okay with, you know, maybe kind of turn no, toward, toward, you know, coming back from deployment and then not mm -hmm. enlisting and then just kind of talk to us a little bit about that transition and, yeah. and heading back into the PTSD treatment. Right. So heading out, I mean, coming out, I, uh, you know, we, we, uh, I always thank the Vietnam vets because they didn't come home the hero that I did. You know I mean? Uh, I was came home to applause and they came home to what we know they came home to. So I always thank them for, you know, it sucks you guys went through it, but at least you taught society, you don't have to support the war, just support the soldier. Right. Um, so I came home to that. I was a war hero, whatever, you know what I mean? And it was, uh, but we were also told that you go from hero to zero pretty quick in America. You know what I mean? People forget pretty damn quickly, which is exactly, you know, what happened that first <laughs> month or so I get out. You know, there's parties going on, there's barbecues and you're having home. Oh, well, Jason, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, and then it dies down. People go back to their normal life. Right. Where my mind, um, I always said my body came back home, but my brain was in Iraq for probably six months. You know what I mean? Cause you, like I said, you adapt into it so much faster when you come back. I mean, and you, there's a line in the movie that, um, Nate says, he says, my, most of my post-traumatic stress comes from lack of traumatic stress. And that line right there went, that is so right, because I missed the adrenaline, which is why I turned to cocaine. Um, and plus, I'm ADHD. You know what I mean? So no different than Adderall, right? right. Um, and so uh, I turned to drugs because, you know, the VA tried to help me, but I... I wasn't going to go in there and listen to a counselor tell, tell me about you. You ain't never been to combat. What the fuck do you know? You know, that I had that attitude. I didn't chip on my shoulder. I didn't, you know, I wasn't going to listen to nobody. Um, the streets also gave me instant gratification. So uh, long story short, I did that. Um, I took Jessica with me, which I struggled with. You know, she got addicted as well. Um, unfortunately, her liver, uh, when we did get off the drugs, uh, we went to drinking because that's more socially acceptable, right? Um and her liver 
didn't tolerate it like mine did. And uh, we were getting her on the liver transplant list. And yeah. So, and then what do I do? I go back to heavy drinking even more because uh, um, I went into a deep depression, of course, because um, you know how I felt about her. You saw it in the beginning of this, this podcast and I lost her. You know, the one person that was left that was going to make Jason feel special. And uh, I, uh, I didn't want to put a gun in my mouth because I didn't want my family to think that I killed myself. But if I got into a car crash, oh, he died in a drunk driving accident. You know what I mean? So my, th- isn't that crazy? Didn't think that, but that literally was going through my mind. Um, guys, I got three DUIs in four months and I got two major car crashes. And all I did is got seven stitches in my, in my hairline up there. And I was driving a little Mazda Miata MX-5 uh, Death trap. turbo with the top down. De- yeah, but it didn't though. And I didn't. Why? You, you weren't I mean? supposed to die. I couldn't even do that right. <laughs> 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 so I, uh, um, after all said and done, the you know what? If you ever, you guys know about the vet court, the veterans court, treatment court. Uh, you mean legal stuff? Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, I get the no. DUIs, yep. and the veterans court literally changed, uh, saved my life. Uh, they could have just locked me up three DUIs in four months. I shouldn't be driving a car. I should have done a year in jail. You know what I mean? All that shit goes along with it. Yep. They reduced it down to two reckless and a DUI. I ended up, they allowed me to go to Southern Oregon for long-term uh, substance abuse and PTSD treatment inpatient four months. And I transferred straight for a fifth month at American Lake VA up here, which is the PTSD program. So they allowed me to get healing yep. instead of just punishment. But uh, you have to live by their, you know, their healing state. You got to go to groups. You got to stay clean. You got to stay sober and stuff. Um, and yeah. And they allowed me to do that. And that's where the, the treatment came from. You know, I, uh, uh, accepted or the, I think my moment in treatment was, you know, most treatments are 30, we call them 30 day spin drives, right? You go in for 30 days, you get sober, they send you back out. Good luck. Um, this one, I think my moment was when I was in my room, we had our private rooms and I had, I called it my prison calendar. You know, you're marking off the days. <laughs> so, um, I, w- I got to the 31st day and I went, wow, if I was in a regular treatment facility, I'd be going home. And I'm literally just getting started, you know, working on myself. You know what I mean? I got cleaned up. I got clarity because, oh, guys, I, I was at like almost 290 pounds because I was drinking so much and I didn't do shit. I was I was an ugly individual. Um, and uh, yeah, and I got myself straightened up and I started working on myself and I was the one that volunteered. I asked the courts if they'd allow me to transfer to the uh, PTSD clinic because I figured if I already gone this far, I may as well keep going and, and really work on why I was drinking. You know, we'd worked on the drinking. Now let's work on why I was doing it. Um, we worked on Jessica, we worked on combat and I came out, <laughs> I moved in. This is the, this is the, everyone at MVP's greatest story about Jason. So I move into my apartment and when I'm moving in, literally I lost the keys to the truck. I couldn't find them. And I was like, what the F? And I thought they might've got swooped off the counter into a garbage. And when I took all the garbage out, I went down to the dumpster and I'm in the dumpster guys, <laughs> digging through garbage bags, trying to find the keys to my truck. And Drew, one of the members, uh, I didn't know, he saw me with an infantry hat. He goes, hey, man, uh, you in the military? And I said, I was, you know, and he goes, you ever heard of MVP? So MVP literally pulled me out of the dumpster. <laughs> 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 That's story. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Jay, um, let me um, just, so I just, let me put the timing in. So from discharge sure. in 2007. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah I kind of moved well, past. Well, no, it's great, though. But I just, so, and then how long was it until, like, with Jess passing, I spent five years, five years, uh, and and probably about six months of it homeless. Uh, about five years okay. as an IV drug user. Yeah, um, and it wasn't until we went into a faith based um, uh, treatment. It was at a church in Burien, which is not too far, actually, in the city I'm in right now, the, where the office is called uh, the Cross Church and Discipleship, which is a uh, free you could go in and get recovered, you know, and um, uh, and it was faith based and everything, and we stayed there for six months. Um, so that would have been 2012 ish. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I got right. hired uh, 2000. Well, no, because 2011. I uh, yeah, we got out in 11. It was like 2010 because I I started at the Hard Rock Cafe in Seattle. Um, you know, I was feeling good about myself, clean and everything, working at Hard Rock. But the Hard Rock Cafe is a party party atmosphere. Yep. Yeah, bad choice, right? A lot of money. Made a lot of money with my with my personality. Um, but I also did you know went back into drugs and, and alcohol, especially. Um, that's when Jess started getting sick. Um, and I, I transferred to this uh, local restaurant called 13 coins and the owner came to me and said, I'm going to lay you off. 
so that you can take care of your wife. Cause I, it's going to be a win-win, you know, restaurants don't like to lay people off to collect unemployment. He goes, but I want you to be able to collect unemployment to be able to feed yourself. But I want you to take care of your wife and that I will be forever in this man's debt. Um, cause I got to spend the last six months of my life with her, just with her every day. And my bills were paid. There was food on the table. Wow. What, a gift. Was, so, what year yeah, was that? When I was uh, taking care of her. I don't know if you've ever taken care of somebody that's dying of liver disease. Um, it, uh, yeah, it's, man, it's, it's, I don't know, demoralizing. I mean, she, I had to help her to the bathroom, you know what I mean? Yeah. Clean up after her. I mean, for her more than me, you know, um, yeah. but I didn't care. I would have cleaned up anything, you know, yeah. I would have done anything. I was just grateful that I got to be there with her for that last six months. Okay. So that would have been two twelve or 13. Yeah. She, well, she died in 17, actually. 17. Okay. Yeah. 17. She died in 2017, beginning of 2017. Yeah. Okay. And so then that's where the, yeah. And then, so what have then the three DUIs were after that? Yeah. After they're just recently, actually. I mean, uh, I, I went through, you know, I, I decided I was going to go to school. You know, I moved down with my brother in Tacoma, my, my one surviving brother, because in that time frame, I lost my two oldest brother and then, and then Jessica, you know, in a five year time span, it was rough. Yeah. Uh, a lot of loss. And then uh, I moved in with my brother, John down in Tacoma so that we could look out for each other, which was code for him watching me because he knew that I couldn't do it alone. Um, and no, and then I went over, there was a community college across the street, went in there, they had a veteran office and I was like, man, I want to be a drug counselor. I can help people, you know? But when I enrolled in school, all they kept saying is self-care is job one, self-care is job one. And it kept resonating in my mind. I'm like, man, I'm not even done grieving my wife. I can't help anybody. So I went to the professors and I'm like, look, I got to bow out gracefully. And they were like, we, we see that. And we we're impressed by the fact that you see that too, because we see that too, you know? And, uh, and they were very nice about it. I mean, I was getting good grades, but it just was resonating. And I'm glad they said that because I, I wouldn't have been able to. So I get out doing a few odd jobs here and there, just trying to find, find out what I'm going to do with my life. Cause when you lose your partner of 21 years, everything in your life changes that moment, that day, everything, you know? Um, so just trying to figure it all out and going through anniversaries, they were rough. Well, then I made it to the, the fifth year and I'm thinking I'm doing really good, man. And all of a sudden just something happened. It clicked, you know, that her birthday came along and I was like, fuck. And I went back into that mindset of screw it. And I started drinking heavy and driving my car uh, at 120 miles an hour. When COVID hit, I got pulled over at 141 miles an hour in my car. There was nobody on I-5 and I went out on a Sunday morning when it was sunny with the top down and just fucking put it in six gear, put, push the foot to the floor and went as fast as I could. And, you know, if the tire popped, then so be it. I knew it'd be fast. But fortunately, there was a cop with a brand new turbo car that chased me down. <laughs> um, but you know what? He was so cool to me, man. He he knew I was a veteran. He knew I was suffering and he took me to the VA hospital. He didn't take me in. He didn't stick me or nothing. He took oh, me to the wow. VA hospital and, and I probably owe that man my, yeah. uh, you know, big. You know, um, obviously he was a vet <laughs> um, and uh, but it didn't stop. I went back out, back to drinking uh, three DUIs in four months. Never been in trouble with the law, though. Never been in trouble up until that point. You know, I, I steered clear even when I was homeless doing IV drug using. I never got in trouble. Um, but uh, the vet court stepped in, allowed me to go down for treatment and uh, came out. Now I'm living, you know, by myself. But I went back to the uh, MVP. I walked down there. Uh, September 23rd of last year, my first huddle, I walked in and sat next to Luke Wilson, Super Bowl champion, Luke Wilson. And when I got up at the end of the huddle, I was sitting next to Luke Wilson, not Super Bowl champion, Luke Wilson. And I realized this is something cool. This was something yeah. special. You know, he's just another guy, you know? Um, and, uh, I think when I had, I had a little relapse and this is a funny story. I can laugh about it now. I had a little relapse. I was at the 13 month sober mark, right? And I drank and Susie, you can ask her, I saying fuck, cussing up and down the store, drunk as fuck on the phone and her just being the loving Susie she was, you know. Um, and the guys were beating down my door, uh, not letting me, you know, went up, we're not going to let you do this. No way. Um, and the, the big moment was when Nate had said to me one time, if you need anything, call me, you know, we can talk. So I decided to call him and I was drunk. <laughs> And he's like, Hey, I'm just getting ready to go into a huddle. I have to call you back. Yeah. Don't tell a drunk, angry veteran that because I ended up cussing him out up and down, left and right. And I thought after, you know, moving forward, if you can cuss out the co-founder like that, he'll still <laughs> accept you. Yeah, this is a pretty unique, pretty, you know, pretty unique 
uh, organizations. But he he told me when I called in and apologized. He said, I knew that wasn't the Jason that I'd met the first time. I knew what was going on in your head. So I let you cuss me out. And I see now that, you know, he goes, your apology was accepted before you said it, you know, and that was pretty special. Uh, that's what really brought me to MVP was when they, they barely knew me just a couple months and they were there for me. Like they were my, my brothers from, from combat and they didn't even hardly know me. And they were there banging my door. Uh, Drew was leaving food up my doorstep, um, texting me, Hey, there's spaghetti outside here. Cause he lived in the building next to me. He's the one that pulled me out of the dumpster. Right. Yep. Uh, him and his wife made spaghetti to drop spaghetti off for me. You know, didn't didn't press me to say there's some food you need to eat. And I'd open the door and there was a bowl of spaghetti right there for me to warm up in the microwave. I was, you know, I, it was the shortest relapse I'd ever had. And I think it's because of those guys. And that it probably was what I needed to fall in love with MVP um, and really know what I feel like I really had those guys that I missed in the Army back. And that's yeah. probably been the, the saving grace for me was that part of the MVP program. And uh, when this job opened up, <laughs> I wanted to make sure I was right. You know what I mean? Just like I said, self-care is job one and the job stayed open, it stayed open, stayed open. So finally, after a bunch of other people saying, Jason, you need to apply because we think you'll do great. I did. And here I am with the job. And and real quick, jumping forward, I think that my moment was when I went into Task Force 12 with the Seahawks. My first weekend, you know, a big deal as a program manager. Um Man, I went in there. I'd never done this job before, man. But you didn't have to teach me the passion. I just never done this job before. Right. Um, Nino, the guy who's the rep for the Seahawks, he tells Nate on the field. Uh, he goes, man, he goes, Jason has a certain fire. He goes, that guy is going to be a great program manager for you. I can't wait to work with him. And that was a huge confidence lifter with me. And yeah. then Noel texted me on the way home, said, Jason, I don't know what you're doing up there, but whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Because we're getting phone calls from people saying that they really love what you're doing in Seattle. And I was like, wow, this is this is pretty fucking cool. So we all go into a new job with some insecurities, but uh, I've never felt more comfortable in my entire life than I feel right now. I yeah. mean, and look, I'm sitting here with George Kittle's dad talking and his sister. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Wait, so, Niner fan. Wait, so fucking just, life is crazy. So one more piece of the, of the timeline. Uh, when did Priscilla come into yeah, the so, story? Oh, uh, Priscilla came into the story. Elvis died um, halfway through my time. Uh, she even went through the homeless time with us. Right. He lived in the car with us. Yeah. Yep. And uh, yeah, man, those two, Jessica and that fucking cat. I, I keep telling her, you know, you're going to fucking ruin my life for a couple of weeks when you die, cat. <laughs> you know what yeah. I, but you know what I do know is I do. I tell people when she gets sick, I told her like, you guys are going to need to watch me. You know, and I, I learned that transparency and telling on yourself is the only way I'm going to stay healthy. Right. You know what I mean? I've told Elliot, my all my friends, I'm, look, you, this is what you need to watch out for, Jason. I, you see how energetic I am. If I'm not answering your text. There's probably a reason right. you need to come knock on my fucking door and find out why. Cause I'm telling you what to look for because I know myself, unfortunately, yeah. and that's the only way I'm going to stay healthy. That's the power of the network though, is that being willing yep. to be vulnerable and to put stuff out there so that, and asking people to hold us accountable for absolutely the, the cause it, you know, we talk about that mindfulness, having a clear vision about who you want to be and how you want to show up. And if you know, there are triggers that will take you away from that you know, yep. building that in and asking for help around those triggers, you know, is a powerful yep. thing to do. And it's hard to do because, you know, in a way yeah. we kind of want to fall into our triggers once in a while because they're kind of enjoyable to be in the moment of it. But later the damage we cause is really painful and we don't want to do that. So having yep. that vulnerability, having people to stand in your corner and being willing to be there, even if you're not being quite the person that you want to be that day. So, and I wow. think the key is also, I told them that I would have to make sure that I, when they did speak up about something that I would hear them. And not go, no, I'm fine. Because if I told you, if you're telling me something, then you're probably seeing something I'm not seeing because I know that about me. So I think that's a big key for me is when they do step up, hopefully they never have to, but if they do, that I have to listen. I have to listen. Yeah. But I think that's, um, so I've only been to one huddle. I got like granted access to go to one when we were in LA, yeah. but just with that and then all the interviews that we do, I think the thing that I'm always so inspired with MVP and like, I'm so grateful to even see it occurring from an outsider's perspective in a way um, is how normal it is to say like, call me on my shit. And like, yeah. you know, it's yeah. so normal to be like, okay, if I'm, you know, exactly what you said, if I'm being distant, if I'm not being energetic, if I'm being kind of sad, or if I'm not responding to you, like those are signals that I'm not okay. And I think yep. number one, it really helps us to take responsibility for ourselves and to know ourselves on such a deeper level of like, these are the things that because how easy is it 
to not, when you're not telling somebody that you need help, just to be like, oh, I'm just going through a phase. Like, I'm just Mm -hmm. going through a phase. I'm just going through this thing. Like, I tell it to myself all the time when I'm like, actually, you know, I'm really like struggling with something. And I think to number one, make it okay to ask for help. But then number two, to actually, when other people are saying like what you said, I, I need help when I'm going through these things. I feel like it, it puts words in people's heads of like, okay, if he's dealing with that, that helps me relate to this. And it like correlates all these things. And like, even just, you know, the power of therapy for me has been when I, it's like, it connects the dots. It's like these extra synapses that fire in my mind where it's like, this emotion means this reaction or this feeling means this, this thing's going to happen in my life. And it helps me to like have a third party or like kind of a more macro view of the whole situation. So, I mean, I just, I love that part of MVP where it's like, I feel like it's just like, as people are having these conversations, there's so many like mental connections going on. Um, and the emotional just resonance that's, it's so strong there. And one thing I learned is, I mean, and, I, and I know what some signs for Jason going down the wrong path are, but also when they happen, I don't know, because like I said, I was doing fine at the five year mark. And all of a sudden I came across, you know, there were times during, you know, anniversaries or, or birthdays and stuff like that'll come up. And the week beforehand, I started noticing, you know, I was an asshole. I started being really edgy on stuff, but I didn't realize why. Well, wait a minute. It's coming up on that. So my mind was already going into that mode subconsciously. Yeah, I wasn't even recognizing it. So I had to say to them, look, I, I may not even recognize it. So I promise you, as your fr- as my friend, I know I trust you enough that if you tell me that you see something weird, then let's uh, I'll listen to you. You know what I mean? I have to. I have to. Well, and you mentioned that the last relapse you had was the shortest one that you've had, you know, yep. and your awareness around it. And, you know, I've heard folks talk about that and being disappointed in the relapse and all that kind of stuff. And it feels like you fall back to zero. But the reality is all the work you've done into that point was still a hell of a lot of growth, a lot of self-awareness, a lot not of maturity, you know what I mean? And a lot of healing. Yep. And so, yeah, yep. okay, we had the relapse, but you're not in the same spot you were five years no. before that. You know what I mean? It's totally different. And no, I still look at one twenty three twenty one as a as a sober date, even though I had a little four day, you know, yeah. binge date. Because my other relapses were months. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, right. uh, but this one, and it was part of the healing of me waking up and going, "Hey, look, this is something new." You know, so that that original, you know, uh, sober date really sticks with me still because all that work I did beforehand. You're right, coach. You're not the first to tell me that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's there's still wins in that. You know, especially when Absolutely. you recover in a quick way. So, well, I want to do this. Let's, uh, cause we've been going a long time and I appreciate that. Yeah, we have. Let, let's, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about mindset. I put a couple quotes yeah. in cause when I was reading your bio and the pieces that we talked. So one of my all time favorite bands is a rise is called rise against out of Chicago, but they're kind of a grunge heavy metal, okay. which is kind of my, hey, we're Seattle. We're grunge. Anyway, yeah. Seattle. I know. I know. <laughs> so anyway, um, there's a song that they've got called audience of one. And there's a quote in there. I've always loved that. We're all okay until the day we're not. Yep. And which the one thing I love about that is that the universality of not being okay. Do you know what I mean? Is that right? And we go along, we go along, we have the days, we have the days and we tell ourselves we're okay. And like you, just like you were talking, things are kind of building, they're under the surface and we don't recognize them because we're just yep. in kind of that mode. And then all of a sudden we're not and that it can happen to any of us at any time. And the other one was, a, it's a song called survive, but it's, it's, this is the quote. Life for you has been less than kind, so take a number and stand in line. We've all been sorry, we've all been hurt, but how we survive is what makes us who we are. And, you know, and I think that's it, you know, that there's no, like, letting go of judgment, letting go of all the shit that we put on ourselves, guilt and shame, yep. and just finding a way to survive. You know, and the, our story started with the the value and attribute that you, you know, took out of your own family setting was the survival that your mom taught you. And yep. I think that's really true in this story as well, is that whether it's your cat or an MVP buddy or, or this yep. new job, you know, or Jess or whatever it is, you know, yep. you've been in that mode and been able to find a way to kind of survive. So I guess I wanted to just talk a little bit about mindset because we, you know, we, we kind of talk about a lot about that, especially with our athletes and that, but yep. the mindset you had to, to, from going from homeless and chronic alcoholism and or street drugs and or yep. whatever, yep. now you're sitting in this chair at the office, you yeah. know, you're an yeah. MVP and you got all this sobriety in you. And yeah, I know. <laughs> Mine so was like seriously, boss, like, seriously. Like, so I'm just wondering, like, what are what are some of the practices or tools that have really helped you? And you've already mentioned a bunch of them, like being vulnerable yep. and owning yep. your own shit and having friends who hold yep. you accountable. So there's a lot of those kind of things. Are there other kind of daily practices, whether it's meditation or mindfulness or breath work or journaling yep. or any of that kind of stuff? Like, what are the things that you kind of hang your hat on? 
to, you know, keep your vision clear, to keep growing, to keep healing. So I like, um, you had mentioned a uh, uh, song. Uh, I read through the, you know, the script when you sent it to me and that's the one that as I'm reading through, so I kind of prep for this is, is that's the one that made all of a sudden the lump build up when I read the, the, the lyrics to survive. Cause I'm like, fuck, this is talking to me. And that's the one that really, really struck me. So I, I'm big on, you know, uh, you see phrases, uh, you know, on, uh, you see, uh, positive affirmation on Facebook, things like that. I always look for those. I try to start my day with those. So I start my day with a positive thing because there's enough negativity. And I've started to realize that I've punished myself enough. Uh, Susie, her big thing, you deserve this. So I constantly tell myself, I deserve sitting right here talking to George. Damn Kittle's right. Family. Yeah. Fucking yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> so uh, my fucking team, right? So I deserve this. And so it, and, and it was weird saying that in the beginning. But now I, uh, the healing is I feel comfortable saying that right now. And I'm not bragging about myself. I'm not a, I don't like, you know, the cocky. Remember I told you about the 49ers, what they attracted. They're the humble victors, you know, that, and that's what I loved about it. I don't need to rub it in your face. And I don't like those kind of people. So um, I didn't like talking about myself. But when now I'm, when, when I talk to and tell my story, I'm not doing it to brag. I'm doing it because I learned that there might be somebody out there that's going to shake their head yes and go, yeah, I know what you mean. Okay, I can, I'll try that too. And so there's a song by Mercy Me. I love Mercy Me. Um, called Say I Won't. It's a new one. I don't okay. know if you've heard of it. I have. You know Mercy Me? I think so. You yeah. know Mercy Me? Yeah, the one who did uh, I Can Only Imagine. The big yeah. the big Christian song, I Can Only Imagine. That's them. Look it up. It's called uh, uh, Say I Won't. It's an amazing song about, you know, tell me I, I tell me I can't do this. You know what I mean? I've, I've been put down. I've been beat down. Tell me I can't and I will. And then I also have this cool when I've saved this, because you said, if I could tell somebody one thing, as, and then it says, sometimes you need bad things to happen to, to inspire you to change and grow. Maybe that's why they're happening to you. Because I constantly ask myself, why do I deserve to be sitting here in this office with all this, leading these guys, you know, helping them out well, after all the shit I did, you know, DUIs, drug use, you know, all this stuff, you know what I mean? Because you, 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 you learn to beat yourself down. and why do I deserve it? You know, why am I still alive? Why did I survive these crashes? Well, I did so I can sit right here right. and I can help a couple vets and I can show them that there's light at the end of the tunnel and it's not a fucking train coming back. That's right. what I, that's for You know what I mean? And that, right. that's what really gets me where I can, I can just tell my story because I'm just a guy, dude. And I'm just a dude that, that joined the military, had a fucking rough patch in life, but I survived him and I right. survived it and I made it. And now look at me, man, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm so fucking proud of myself. I've never been more proud of myself in my entire life. That's good. We're proud of you too. Yeah, there's no Thank doubt. You. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And, and you wouldn't be the person you are and you wouldn't be able to do the things you no. do and say the things you say and sit with the right. people that you sit with in the way that you do if you hadn't been through those things. And just like you said, instead of beating yourself up, it's like looking back and going, okay, what's the lesson here? What, what is the universe trying to teach me? This isn't, Absolutely. I'm not getting, it's not punishment. Okay. So I relapsed or this happened or I got in an argument with so-and-so like what button got yeah. pushed, what's behind that. Cause, and you, you've done a great job this whole time. The awareness you had and the willingness to step back and say, okay, why am I drinking? What, what's going on? Right. Why am I being pissed off and all that kind of stuff yeah. and looking for those answers behind that and say, what is the lesson in this moment? Cause actually all of the things in life are really opportunities for growth and learning if Absolutely. we're willing, if we're willing to see them that way, instead of God damn, this sucks and blah, blah, blah. And like, okay, well, yeah. it does suck, yeah. but then w why am I sitting in this here? You know, often because of the choices that we've made or maybe life is just in the role. And so it's all that kind yeah. of stuff. So, but anyway, all right. That yeah, you know, is all. You would have loved Jessica. You would have loved Jessica. So what you're saying now, every time we'd be driving, like if I miss my turn, I'd be like, God damn it. I missed my turn. And her response every time and it pissed me off. Well, maybe, maybe the universe just kept you from getting into a car accident. Maybe you weren't supposed right. to turn down that road. I'd be like, oh, I hate you. <laughs> yeah. You're right. <laughs> just kind of take a yeah. breath and say, okay, well, maybe yep. there's something beautiful around this corner that I needed yeah. to see today. So this is thanks all... to your, your mindfulness and everything, honestly, but I did that. I practiced it because road rage was a big thing. For me. I mean, driving in, in downtown Baghdad isn't like driving on I-5 here in Seattle. You know what I mean? They, we can't give warning shots on I-5. <laughs> they frown right. on that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, can't do that. So yeah, exactly. Get out of the way. Um, learning your, you know, the mindfulness techniques really, I mean, now if someone cuts me off or if, you know, if somebody does something that I think stupid, I'm like, well, you know what? I don't know what you're thinking, but you go ahead and do you. Cause I'm just doing me, you mm -hmm. know? And it's, it's really changed my mindset of how I, I react. That's what it is. It's helped me with my reaction. Right. Well, it's a chosen response. You're not just reacting. Sure is. 
you're choosing yeah. about how you want to respond to that. And we talk about that all yeah. the time is like, why put energy into stuff that you can't control? Absolutely. Can't control right. That person being an asshole. So why am I pissed about that? Like there's, right. and you he's know controlling I mean? me when I allow him to piss me off. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's, yeah. there's no sense in that. So, well, I want to end with a quote out of your, the stuff that you sent me. And that was right. one, one of the things that I find most powerful about working with MVP and what they've done for me is that there is a story. There's a, there is hope and that you no longer have to go it alone. And yeah. so, and I think, you know, that really is it. And just as you mentioned about being able to tell your story in this way, and as low as things might've gotten and as painful, I mean, here you are. And so there is hope. And if we can just keep kind of taking those small, consistent steps in a certain direction, yeah. great things can happen. These are great things. Yeah. Right. And, and we all don't have to, and we don't have to be alone. Direction. So, yeah. um, all right. Well then I guess the last things, Emmy, we've been rambling here, so I don't, I don't want to cut you off. Are there, is, oh, hi, Emmy. Have... I didn't know you're here. <laughs> no, you're great. Cause one of the things I love is that she hears things in a different way than I do. And she's always coming Amen. at it from a, so I was going to step into the kind of the hidden pearl stuff and then what gives him hope, but I, I, I don't want to leave you off. I mean, anything in here that you wanted to kind of jump on? Cause I, I know you're taking notes. There is something is... I'd like to say. Yeah. Good. Okay. Please, roll with Dad. it. Please. Let's hear it. Um, so I think the, the thing that keeps coming up for me is like radical responsibility. And I think a big shift happened in my life when instead of being like, I'm going to own part of my shit, or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to like talk about the good stuff is it's, it's when you just own it all. And I think when you're in a situation where your life is very reactive and it's very like touch and go, or we, you know, we're doing things to kind of get a reaction, you know, I mean, your example of like, if I get in a car crash, that's, that's such a great example. Like then I don't have to be here anymore. I don't have to deal with it. And it's just like going a hundred percent or like a full speed ahead, but like not really having control and, you know, trying to kind of get a reaction either way. But we're in those situations and whether it's like a car crash or drunk driving or like something that extreme, or it's just like trying to get attention from somebody. Um, if we aren't owning 100% of what we're doing, we're still riding in that victim seat. And we're still like, we're in that victim backpack where it's like, it's kind of my fault, but it's not really. And I think your story, like it's continually over and over. It's just like owning 100% of your shit. And it's, I mean, just radical responsibility where it's like, this is all me all the time and I'm going to own it all. And I think it's so beautiful because when you come into that, where it's like, this is all me, it's that just open vulnerability of being like, it's like, say something like, like, yeah. you know what I mean? Or it's like, what is that? <laughs> so Eminem, I have the same birthday as uh, Eminem. You're going to do eight mile, aren't you? Yeah, you're going to do eight mile. Yes, yes. It's like, what are you Here, tell them that? something they don't know about me. I exactly. love that lie, right? Yes. Exactly. It's so, it's so eight mile because it's like, yes. tell me something I don't know. You know, like yeah. I already know where I'm at, but like, I know where I'm going and I know what I can do. Yeah. And so it's just Eminem. Yeah. I'm not, uh, I'm not ashamed of where I've been because of yeah. where I am now. You know what I mean? I, and I made it out and I mean, I, I used to have been told that I, you know, that I, that I was a strong guy for me, my nephew, you know, not many people would have made it through that Jason. And, and you hear the words and they go, you know, okay, great. Thanks. But man, I, I look back and I mean, just talking right here, um, a, pe a lot of people go through some shit, but man, I made it through some shit and I'm standing here pretty fucking strong about it. You know what I mean? And, and, but my, my goal is, is that I, I just want to let somebody else know that maybe going through some crazy shit too, that, that you can make it. I don't care how bad it is. You can, you know, but I, my best thing that I was told when I was in treatment, he said, I would have been so mad if I would have forgot to say this, that Jason, did you win any firefights by yourself over there in Iraq? And I went, fuck. And he goes, what makes you think you're going to win any here? And I went, oh, because you're not going to win any fights here by yourself. Just like you didn't win any over there by yourself. You need That's to a great. Right. That is that's funny. He put it. He put it exactly how I needed to hear it. Because I literally got mad at him for saying it because he was so right. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it stuck with me. Uh, it stuck with me, uh, Coach. It really did. And that to this day, I'm still, I'm still uh, using that line because it's so poignant. Uh, and I try to tell all of those, those combat vets: you didn't win anything by yourself over there. You had to call in air support. You had to call in your other squad up for support. Why aren't you doing it here? You know, same thing. Well, and I think there's so much freedom in that. The stuff you were talking about, Em. Like when we own our own stuff instead of just part of yep. it and we're not blaming other people, it's like, I made all these choices, you know, and maybe yep. there's some bad luck along the way, but kind of, you know, I believe the world rises up to meet you at your level of expectations and the energy you project. 
And so yeah. these are my choices. I'm sitting here and when you own it and accept it and it, or acknowledge yeah. it, there's a freedom in it. Like nobody, like what the fuck? Okay. And then you let go of the judgment and the guilt. And the other one, the freedom comes to in, I'm not going to hide this. I, I'm I'm not going to live in secrets. I'm not going to wear masks anymore. Yeah. I'm not going to pretend to well, be somebody. So I'm not. It's that's so, so nice. it's just like, I don't have to worry about that. Okay. Did I tell this person a lie or did I not? And all that yeah. bullshit. And then when you got your comrades there and we're all in this together, it ain't perfect. It ain't pretty, but what the fuck we're human and we're yep. working our way through it the best we can. And I'm willing to be yeah. here in the mud, in the muck and the mess with you. Absolutely. Shit. It's free. It sure the fuck is. Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well then, um, so we know you're going to be there, I guess let's close out. So we always like to talk about, um, we kind of, I'll throw the two questions at you. One is, you know, the hidden pearls thing is about, you know, trying to find within other people lessons and the good in other people, because we believe that humanity at its core is good and can care about each other. And so if we come across the hidden pearl, and so I guess I just want to acknowledge that you're certainly one for us. Your story has been very inspiring and enlightening and everything. So that's been great. So if you come across somebody like that and or, you know, in all of this, what are the core things, maybe a couple, and I think you've shared a bunch, but is there something in particular that is really giving you hope in this moment that inspires you to kind of get up every day and keep fighting the fight? Um, the next level of healing for me is by, by being put in charge. Um, I love the fact that I'm going to be held accountable as somebody um, in the spotlight of, you know, I'll run the huddles. Um, I better have my shit right. You know, if I'm going to ask you to have your shit right, that's the, you know, they, they say the best way to, to learn something is someone will teach you how to do it. You do it in front of them. Uh, uh, you show them how to do it and they, or, you know, you show them, you can, with them watching and then you teach somebody to do it. Isn't that the, the way to, yep. to learn something the best way? Right. So the same thing with the leadership. Now that I'm up there, I gotta, I gotta walk the line. If I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, tell somebody, Hey, look, you know, you can make it out because look where I'm at, but if I'm still fucking up and I'm still, you know, an idiot, then you're not really holding yourself accountability. And I, and I want to show that I can hold myself accountable and be vulnerable and say, look, you know, I made it through this and, and, and I'm not that damn special. I need help. You know what I mean? <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's for me, somebody like that. And, and it worked with my new best friend, Elliot, um, who, who is now my, uh, the volunteer partner here. He was uh, doing the, vo- uh, the, the program manager as a volunteer before I took over. And he, we met at a, at an event with, uh, the mission continues and he went through the PTSD program right after I did. And we just became, you know, tight buddies. And, uh, that's the thing, you know I mean? Holding each other accountable, um, but holding yourself accountable in front of people, I think is the biggest thing for me. That's huge. Okay. Yep. Well then, um, normally we would send our interview person because usually they're in the Bay Area for at home. You're not. Yeah. So we have a couple of tickets for you. So I'm guessing that it might end up being the Niner game up in Seattle uh later in the season. So we'll we'll work on that. Okay. So we okay. like to do that. And then we always do a donation. I'll have to think about it. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Might be busy. Then, yeah. Now I know you're going to be a little conflicted because you're working the Seattle crew. Not that day, brother. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Okay. Just checking. Not just that day. Know. You don't worry about that. Okay. And I will then, walk um, into that stadium proud wearing that red jersey. <laughs> okay. And then uh, we always do a donation. So I'm guessing you want to go with MVP, but we'll support any. Please do. Okay. Yes, so we'll please. do a yes. we'll do a donation in your name to uh, MVP. So uh, we'll get that done here this week as well. So. All right. Um, just offer then, Emma, any uh, words of hope or inspiration or other summary that you want to offer and close us out with some love, aspiration and insightful wisdom? Ooh, uh, the things that are giving me hope is number one, that you wear a 49ers jersey under a Seattle jersey. Like, <laughs> awesome. I love the 49er fan base. They're so great. That's so good. That's closer um, to the heart, baby. Closer to the heart. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> I had to protect then, my skin from that blue shit. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, number two is being back on the podcast. It feels so good to like sit down and have these conversations again. Oh, so being back with Pops and then Jason, this is quite the interview to come back to. So thank you so much. Um, and I guess just like, well, okay, I got two more. The other one is I think it's so awesome to hear a man as, I mean, kind of macho and like, you've just like done so many crazy things. And I think to come back and still find so much strength and compassion, it's just very inspiring. And I think that's such a healing message for men to see right now. Um, And I think, yeah. So I just, there's so much, you have so much medicine in you and just showing up and being so loving and holding space with people is like, it's amazing. Um, So that gives me a lot of hope. And also just 
I I'm reflecting on how there's some areas of my life that I might not be completely owning and just saying fuck it and owning it and you know walking into the fire with it because the more that I own the more that I can control and the more that I can just be free yeah. I've enjoyed that that part of it uh Emma about realizing you know I'm I'm not perfect I, I make a mistake and I can go look what I did you know what I mean I, it, it's it's so freeing. I mean, that, that weight. Yeah. Just leaves. And, uh, can I say, uh, you saying those things, um, I, I'll be honest coming onto the podcast. I mean, there were a couple things. Um, I I'm a geek about my 49ers. I'm a fucking geek. I mean, listen, when people, I don't watch games with many people because I'm, I'm pretty animated. I pace in front of the TV. I'm pretty, you know what I mean? So, oh, totally. uh, yeah. And so coming on here, uh, I was a little nervous, but I, I want to thank you guys for making me feel comfortable. Um, and, uh, being able to talk, uh, cause I still think it's pretty freaking cool where I'm at right now and who I'm on screen with right now. Um, but, uh, that's just because George is a badass and I don't give a fuck. <laughs> so, um, but I really just, I, I just love the, how the fact, I mean, I, I can, I used to be kind of spastic. I still am kind of spastic, but it's more of a, a controlled spastic now. And, and I get, I used to get nervous a lot and, and I wouldn't hear what you had just said that I have a lot to give and I have medicine. I would never really hear that, but I do now. And I appreciate you telling me that. Cool. All right, Emmy, I just, uh, on your thing, and I think that it's more freeing and easier. We already talked about not going it alone, but when we sur surround ourselves with other people who are on that same journey and committed to accountability and vulnerability, it really pulls us into it and we're able to do things maybe that we couldn't have done on ourselves. And then the hope for me, your story, Jason, but I guess I just want to shout out as my background as a criminal defense lawyer. So I had vet court back in Iowa where we are at and probably 35 to 40% of my criminal defense load were all veterans. And I dealt with substance abuse treatment referrals, PTSD, but we had a pretty decent vet court as well. And that, so I guess I just want to put a shout out to the cop who stopped you and took yeah. you to the VA instead of a, you know, because 140 miles an hour, you, they jail you and leave you for a while for that. Yep. And, and three yeah, DUIs. Yeah, the car, the whole thing. Yeah, and three DUIs in most states, the third one's a felony. You know, yep. and so, and at least in Iowa and Wisconsin, that's up to five years in prison. Then you don't serve that yep. much, but you're 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 not going to the county jail. You're going to prison. And so yep. just for administrators and bureaucrats and other folks, you know, just looking behind the person and the offense and yep. giving people a chance and creating resources and tools for people to actually get better. And so that really gives me hope when I hear stories about people that are paying attention and doing those kind of things instead of just automatically running people through the system. So that gives me a lot of hope that the system might be recognizing some of those things. And it's not just veterans. I mean, there are people in other situations that also need that help. So that's very inspiring as well. So, all right, man, thank you for all the time. So this is a great one. A lot of nuggets in here. We'll have to kind of distill all yeah. that. So yeah. Emma will start working on it and uh, really appreciate you, man. Love you. And it's been great. Hey, thank you. More, more your story and Lubu. Yeah. It, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to have you on. So I'm not always having to fill the next question and all that kind of stuff. And again, <laughs> I, I respect and appreciate so much kind of your insight and approach to uh, the things that we're experiencing this way. And so you just bring a whole nother story out to it. So, all right, Jay, you have a great one. Uh, let's see, you guys, Thank are you. you're, you're you. on tonight, right? You got huddle tonight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got the huddle tonight. Looking forward to it. Thursday's my favorite day, of course. It has been for the last year, you know. Yeah. I've only missed six huddles in the year, what, 13 months I've been going. Six huddles. Yeah. I need That's it. great. I need it. All right, we'll stay on. Tell everybody hello for us, and then I will. Uh, we'll. Uh, I will send you a direct December link. December fifteenth. Yeah, yeah. I got you on the list, so we'll take care of it. It's, it's, it looks like it's shaping up. These two, it's a two-team division. So looks, here we are again. Looks like it. Again, here, we yeah. are again. So here we are again. Here we are again. Those last few weeks will uh, determine a lot. Yeah, because we go. Let's see. Yeah, it, the last four games we got Seattle, Washington, and Las Vegas both out, and then we end with the Cardinals. So. Uh, but that yeah. those games will uh, be di dictating quite a bit. So I also, right. uh, as we were talking about like Seattle grunge, uh, one of my friends is a musician in Seattle. And so we were talking about uh, listening to some grunge music. And I think there are actually some like great shows. So I'm just going to plant the seed that uh, maybe we hit a grunge There's show. While always we're... good music. They're yeah. always good music. You know, the show so, box, all that stuff. I'll, I'll start researching what's happening in that week. And I'll, and I'll let you know. Now, and M, you know what? That's a Thursday night football game up there. So the, the actual yep. game in Seattle is Thursday. So it'd be easy to, you know, stay for two more days, get a Friday and a Saturday up there and then come back. Stay for the weekend. Wait, yep. so if, if the game's on a Thursday, are you going right. to miss another yeah. huddle? Yeah. Yes. 
I'm going to that game. Are you? I've been to the last three. I didn't care what it took. I've, I've been there the last three. For, last year was easy because it was at the end of the season and the Seahawks fell apart. So the Seahawks fans were giving away their tickets. I had really good seats for that one. Um, and I was there at the one when, when we stopped them at the inch line uh, on the last, last game of the year. And I was at that game. And uh, I will be at this game no matter what. Because <laughs> it's, yeah. it's shaping up to be a good one again. Yeah, man. Oh. I, that game... We, Claire and I were sitting down in the midst of the, we were the only Niners just about in this section we were in and yeah. they were MFing us and yelling at us the whole time. Oh yeah. The way the game was going. And then on that drive, well, we were whooping and, them in the first half. I know. Whooping I them know. bad in the first half. And then the, everything flips and they're on that drive and they're just pointing at us and like, see you yep. suckers and all that shit. And then the tackle and made, it. and it's like, it is just freaking dead. The whole cool crowd, you know, just they the, were so pissed the around me. Done, everybody's they quiet, gotta review you know? it. They gotta and, review it. <laughs> and Claire and I were looking at each other, and I'm just I start talking smack right up. Hey, yep. what the fuck? You know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, dog. Hey, see you later. Anyway, it was yeah. that's one. It's football's amazing. Anyway, all right, football's man, amazing. All right, it is. Take care. The Niners are. The Niners yes. are. Hey, thank all you guys right. so very much, man. This was this was an amazing experience. I appreciate you guys so much. I mean, again, with my confidence, you know, you guys are are still my healing is every day. And I appreciate this opportunity. All right. Well, we appreciate you. All right. Take care. We'll stay in touch. Yes, sir. And, uh, yes, we will. We're, Emmy and I are going to chat for a second afterwards on some stuff. <laughs> All right. But we'll talk to you uh, later. Real quick. Let me know. Let me know if you guys do another mindful. The, the, some of the guys were asking, let me know if you guys have one in the mix. All I've right. got a, yeah, I got a call in with uh, professor McGee. So I'm trying to get that scheduled. We're thinking about just no doing worries. like one or two a month, maybe even just one a month to get it started okay. again and kind of get going. So we'll have a schedule out sure. shortly. Okay. Yep, I told them you were thinking about it. Thank you guys so very much. You guys have a good one, huh? Thanks, All right. Jason. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for sticking around for that show. We hope you enjoyed the interview with Jason. Um, if you want any information, everything will be linked in the show notes. There's also, um, if you want to get involved, you can share this episode on your social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the things. Um, we're even on TikTok. And um, another thing that really helps our show is if you go on the Apple Podcast and subscribe and download. And if you leave us a review, five stars, four, five, four. Um, <laughs> but if you do that, it helps us to boost our ratings so more people hear the show and can get connected to the organizations that they need. So we'll be making a donation to Merging Vets and Players this week in Whoa. Jason's name. So just want to say thank you, everyone. Thank you to Merging Vets and Players, and happy Veterans Day. Happy Veterans Day.